do you have any goal at all of growing as a human being, of being a better person? Is that at all a goal for you? You know, and feeling comfortable within your own self and not feeling you have to constantly prove something. We, we often find there are a lot of grandiose, narcissistic dreams and goals we had at one point, which we just totally don't have anymore because we've done inner work. So these kinds of questions help starting from within as opposed to from without. Hey, people, there you are. Welcome to the podcast. Today, we're going to explore the psychology of self-actualization and transcendence. And we're going to do it with Scott Barry Kaufman. Scott is a cognitive scientist and humanistic psychologist who was taught at Columbia, Yale, NYU, Penn, and elsewhere. He received his PhD in cognitive psychology from Yale, a master's in experimental psychology from Cambridge, and a bachelor's in psychology and human computer interaction from Carnegie Mellon. Currently, Scott is the founder and director of the Center for the Science of Human Potential. He hosts the number one psychology podcast in the world, The Psychology Podcast, and in 2015 was named by Business Insider as one of 50 groundbreaking scientists who are changing the way we see the world. In addition to writing for The Atlantic, Scientific American, Psychology Today, and Harvard Business Review, Scott is the author and editor of nine books, the latest of which is entitled Transcend, The New Science of Self-Actualization. And that book forms the basis for today's discussion about how and what it means to pursue a transcendent life. I found Scott to be really engaging, fun, frank, vulnerable. I really enjoyed talking to him. So this is me and Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman coming at you in three, two, one, go. Cool, man. Well, Scott, I'm so happy to meet you. This has been a long time coming. Yeah, it really has. And it's a real, real honor for me. It's an here. honor for me. Uh, there's so many things that I want to talk to you about. Uh, you have written extensively on subject matter that is dear to me personally um, mm. that I'm excited to explore with you today. Uh, of course, self-actualization and transcendence, which you explore beautifully uh, by extension of the work of Abraham Maslow, who mm. you were just chatting about before the podcast mm. and how meaningful he's been in your your life uh, by dint of this fantastic book that you've put out recently, Transcend. Uh, but prefatory to that, um, I think it would be really interesting and also to help kind of contextualize your background a little bit to uh, talk about um, being a late bloomer. Oh, Because wow. that's something that I'm familiar with. We have different versions of late bloomer stories, but I think your story and the work that you've done around late bloomers kind of helps set the stage for talking about these other things. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm really interested in potential and uh, studied things from prodigies, you know, these kids who really start really, really young and um, you're like, how the heck did they able to play a complete piano sonata <laughs> like without ever taking any lessons, you know, um, to savants, to all sorts of things. And um, so there's different ways of thinking about late bloomers. In my specific case, um, I was in special education uh, very young because I was essentially deaf the first three years of my life. It made it very hard for me to process things in real time. And teachers took that as an indication that I was stupid. Uh, not just teachers, but like bullies and mm -hmm. everyone. Well, everyone. <laughs> Um, and my mom believed in me though. <laughs> my parents believed in That's me. important. Yeah, uh, that is super important. Uh, so I, re I repeated third grade. Um, so a late boomer in that sense as well. Um, so I was um, delayed there and uh, I was kept in special education with, oh, it's a very uh, heterogeneous group in special education. So I was with uh, problem kids, you know, who, the you know, like the most, you know, um, acting out, you know, kids in the school so that they, they would like bully me in special ed. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why did he put me with, yeah. <laughs> with my bullies <laughs> in the same room? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, school. Um, but uh, to, uh, you know, autism spectrum, you know, there's such a wide range of people that were put into put in there. And I was kept there all the way till ninth grade, um, but always did feel as though I was capable of more. 
um, I really was confused that on the one hand, the way I was kind of treated by the school, but on the other hand, I knew my inner life. I had a rich inner life. I just loved fantasy and imagination. And I would like act out like soap opera plot lines in my head where I was like the leading man and I uh-huh. would like, be to be continued every day. And then the next day I would pick up in my head. <laughs> it's all in my head. You know, I would like write stories and novels and things. Um, so there was really this duality within me that was really um, frustrating and confusing um, because I was, I was like, well, can I question the authorities at all? You know, like, you know, they, they everyone thinks I'm dumb, but I do feel like there is greater potential within me. Uh, and it really, it really took, uh, you know, you feel free to stop me at any time, but. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I, you know, at, at some point you, you have this teacher in ninth grade who believes in you and that becomes kind of a lever for you to break out of this paradigm. But what I find interesting about this, and mm-hmm. I haven't heard you talk about is wh- the origin of that, that, belief in self that Mm. persisted despite all this kind of external, you know, input that was trying to tell you that there was something wrong with you. I try to, I think about that a lot. Um, I've had some great conversations with like Angela Duckworth who wrote a phenomenal book called Grit um, uh, about this because my office was right next door to hers when I was Mm. at Penn. Oh, wow. Um, I was running the Imagination Institute while she was running the character lab. Uh So we were like, oh, we should like team up and like see what the the conjunction of imagination and grit would be sort of thing. But we would have lots of like walk home talks um, as we walk home from after a long day of work, try to just understand what was it that was really going on with me in my personal life. I think, I think grit is, is a big part of the story. I think I'd be remiss not to say there was this confluence of passion and perseverance within me. Um, and it's the confluence of the two that I think is really important. Mm. Uh, any one without the other is, um, uh, you know, if you just have perseverance without passion, that's just like duty. Mm-hmm. You know, if you just have passion without perseverance, what is that? That's just excitement. <laughs> right. But then the question becomes, are those, uh, you know, inbred traits that you just had coming out of the womb or was there something about the resistance that you were meeting in your world that that you know emboldened them or strengthened them um yeah i think that it, it got unlocked you know to use a, a a bad scientific metaphor it's not like a key that gets unlocked but it, there was a point in my life where this special ed teacher took me aside in ninth grade after class and she asked me you know what are you still doing here um she saw my fresh she was the first one to really just even ask me that question. You know, we talk like in the coaching world, we talk about powerful questions, right? Um, questions that really cause you to have a uh, huge self-transformation. We'll talk about a powerful question in my life. This this woman, all she asked me, she's like, what are you still doing here in special ed? And, and I thought to myself, what am I still doing here? I processed what she said. And I said, yeah, what the fuck am I still doing uh-huh. here? And it and something really got unleashed in me, like in that moment, something I had been building up for many, many years. It's almost like I just needed some catalyst or someone to just even question that I maybe I had more potential. And I just like from there, like it was wildfire. Like I just, I, I called my mom. I ran to the payphone and called my mom and I said, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to special ed anymore. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. out. <laughs> she's like screaming. She's like, what did they do to you over there? <laughs> but I, I, I set up a meeting with the school psychologists, the administrators, the special ed teachers, and um, they had nothing in the rule books of our school system for that to be the case for a, a special ed student to break out by themselves. Mm. So you had to like litigate this. It was the first time they had nothing. They were like looking through the like, What do we do with this mm. situation? They're, and so what they decided on is they were going to let me out on a trial basis. So I was like, thanks for the vote of confidence, guys. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we're yeah. going to let you out. Uh-huh. You can take mainstream classes. Even I know you want to take honors classes. Fine. We'll let you take some honors classes. But if you fail, you, you know, you're coming right back in. But, but in that moment, I will tell you, my attitude was, oh, I'm going to prove them. Yeah. Like, you know, I think um, a big part of my um, 20s and from high school from that point up to maybe the end of my 20s was um, really driven by the underdog motivation, which is a phenomenon I'm really fascinated about and I write about and I'm actually working on an article, a bigger article about it right now, but I think it's huge. Yeah. I, I mean, I can certainly relate to that. You know, I was wondering as you're telling that story, then looking at all of these higher degrees that you've accumulated and you know you just you, you just you publish with abandon you're just you're very prolific in your writing um, how much of that is motivated how much of your motivation can be tracked back to still trying to prove those kids <laughs> wrong you know in, in that classroom yeah a big part of it uh, another part of it is I really discovered I loved learning uh, and uh, I felt like I had a lot to catch up on you know there was a real feeling of well, okay, here's the deal. At that point when I got out, I was like, okay, Scott, here's the deal. You're not college bound right now. Mm-hmm. What 
is it going to have to take for you even a college to even look at you? I mean, I had to catch, think about this situation. I was in ninth grade. I was, you know, uh, I, I got out of special ed. I was not on a college track. And so I was like, I'm going to do this. And, mm. and in order to do something like that, you know, I had to pull all the stops. I signed up for everything, as many courses as I could for the summer school classes, you know, to like catch up. Um, I signed up for like honors classes and I was in remedial classes. So I didn't even want to take standard. I was like, let's just go, let's just go for it. Wow. So I signed up for like honors Latin and ended up being a Latin scholar. I ended up like, um, I mean, I wasn't good at everything. I like, I, I tried a lot of things that mm -hmm. like I, I remiss that I tried, <laughs> like not remiss, but uh, like West Side Story. I, 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 I was like, can't do this dancing. I dropped out of West Side Story in <laughs> uh <-huh>. community theater. <laughs> but you tried. I did try. I did try. I, I, but I, I did sign up for like everything. And I was like, I'm going all in on this. And I just had this uh, voracious um, passion um, to learn as well. I mean, I think part of the story is also to prove people wrong. But I think there was also like that, that that's, that's not a sustainable motivation by itself. Right. I think when you pair that, you know, that kind of passion passion to prove people wrong is that still a passion that's a passion mm -hmm. um but i combined it with a real love of learning and um just voraciously wanting to catch up i felt i was be so behind i just wanted to catch up mm. so you go on to you know basically pursue this very su successful career um and you know looking back in retrospect it's helped form these interesting ideas that you have about education. You've got this manifesto on your website mm. about, you know, change, uh, you know, kind of uh, altering the the paradigm of education is something that I think a lot about um, as a parent of a bunch of kids and mm. seeing what they go through and how it could be better, um, and also just this idea of of what it means to be a late bloomer and how we judge people too quickly early in their development that has you know damaging implications for how they think about themselves and ultimately you know pursue their lives in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all have it we have it all wrong about what the markers of potential are. Um, especially in a K through 12 system. This notion that it's okay the kids there we got to get make sure they're getting perfect SAT scores. We have to make sure they're getting into the right college. We have to make that's going the wrong direction, you know. Mm -hmm. Basically, what you're saying is we need to find the kids who are really good at conformity. We need to find the kids that don't uh, don't aren't in detention. You know, we got. I mean, it's it's we've really got it backwards. Yeah, it's completely backwards. It's reminiscent a little bit of uh, David Epstein's book Range. I love him. Which I talk about book. all the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, book. your ideas and his ideas kind of overlap in that, He's that a good Venn friend. diagram. Yeah. yeah, you know, the idea of trying to instill in young people uh, curiosity and at least enough gumption or courage to try lots of different things and kind of hold them lightly so that yeah. you're like yourself, like trying lots of stuff as a young person that all ends up kind of congealing in the soup of, you know, creating a person who becomes ultimately if they, you know, are embracing this, this hierarchical model of, of meeting their needs, creates a situation in which they're perfectly suited for what they end up doing in the world. And that's self-actualization. Yeah. That's a really good quick definition of what Maslow meant by self-actualization. Yeah, so let's so let's talk about that. Um, self-actualization, transcendence, my favorite subjects. <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which most people are familiar with. Uh, so why don't we start with kind of defining our terms before yeah. we launch into this? Because you that's have, you know, have, have definitions of these things that I think are different from what people might expect. Absolutely. So uh, Abraham Maslow is a humanistic psychologist, uh, the, one of the founders of the field of humanistic psychology. Uh, big in the 1560s, had this notion of self-actualization. Earlier on in his career, he viewed self-actualization as um, becoming all that you're capable of becoming uniquely. Like, what is your creative potential? What is your highest creative potential? You can differentiate that from the lower needs that we have, which are needs we share in common with other people. So we all have the needs for safety, the needs for connection to a certain degree. Um, we don't like loneliness, for instance. A uh, need for respect, a uh, need for, to a certain degree, a need for, for uh, self-esteem. These are things we all share with others. They don't make you particularly unique by saying, oh, you know, I really want friends, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you can play a violin concerto like no one else in the world can play it, you know, okay, now we're talking. You know, there's something really unique seed, or you can do anything like that. Really, um, really is gets to the core of of your own unique uh, being. Uh, then we we start talking about self actualization. But I want to say there was like a pre 
uh, phase in Maslow and a, and a later phase, which is what I've been trying to kind of carry the baton in a, in a, in a certain way to uh, make clear that towards the end of his life, especially after he had his heart attack and he survived the heart attack, his whole worldview changed and it changed quite dramatically. And he started to see self-actualization a little bit differently than he, he used to see it. He started to see it really as just a bridge to transcendence. Um, he says at one point, he says, well, it seems like the function of self-actualization is actually to erase itself. Um, so when done right, we self-actualize our unique creative potentials in such a way where we are giving it out to the world, where our being is so um, uh, in synchrony with the world. And it's uh, synergy is the word mm -hmm. we use, synergy with the world, that what is automatically good for me is good for others. Uh, that what I, you know, my being and the things I'm doing in the world like your podcast. <laughs> you love doing your podcast, but it's so much in synergy with what other people want to hear. People, you know, you're 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 really helping the world by doing something you love. Um, is that does it feel like you're self-actualizing every day or, or are you transcending? I would argue you're more transcending. Mm -hmm. you know? So the idea being that self-actualization is aligned with a more individualistic pursuit of self-betterment, right? It's focused on the self, whereas transcendence, which is an outgrowth of self-actualization becomes more outward looking in terms of like what you're contributing to the betterment of humanity. Yeah. And or, or, or aligning um, the actions or your behavior that are the result of self-actualization with that mission of, of global betterment or the betterment of humanity. Is that accurate? Yes, and I don't, I wanna be clear that I don't necessarily mean um, in some, uh, like your life's a failure if it hasn't happened in some um, hugely like uh, economically impactful way or like uh, like a quant quantitative way, you know, um, that the goal is always to uh, help a billion people on the planet or help a million people have huge businesses. I think there are people who do inquire ways um, I, I talked a little bit about this light triad and I don't know if we want to like mm -hmm. double click yeah, on that yeah. yet, but there's a certain way of being that I think is underappreciated. And I think that gives back to the world in beautiful ways um, every day. I mean, you can have someone who has a company, runs a company and is, you know, is bragging about how many people they're impacting, but they're an asshole to people in their, in their life every single day of their lives. Well, that counts too. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, that counts. You know, I think um, a lot of my work is really about being more than doing. Um, and I think doing is very important. Don't get me wrong. I think like actually um, changing the world, but I think we underestimate the extent to which your being can change the world, mm -hmm. if that makes mm -hmm. sense. The Maslow's hierarchy of needs is is commonly understood as this pyramid. And you know, I wanna talk about how that's not the case. And you have this sailboat analogy that, that much better, you know, kind of encapsulates what he was getting at. Um, but I am interested, I do wanna spend a little time on that difference between doing and being, right? Because mm -hmm. that pyramid uh, paradigm sort of connotes like an active verb relationship with these needs. You're, you're working your way through all of these things in lockstep. Whereas being is more of a letting go and allowing process, which is mm -hmm. ephemeral and I think difficult to kind of wrap our brains around how that actually operates. Mm. So the distinction between being and doing, yeah? Um, well, you know, I'm also a personality psychologist. So a lot of being is just a fancy uh, uh, spiritual way of saying personality. You know, what are our patterns of behaviors um, that uh, have maybe become habits to a certain degree that we, they become so ingrained in us that they're like automatic ref reflexes now mm -hmm. uh, when we encounter certain things. So when I, for instance, when I wrote my book, Wired to Create, a lot of that book was about um, how to have creativity as part of your being. Now, that doesn't mean you're not doing things in the world. It means that you have certain habits of mind, certain habits of ways of acting and responding to the world that consistently moves you in the direction of greater creativity, like openness to experience is a way of being. Mm -hmm. you know? That phrase, by the way, a way of being was big among the humanistic psychologists, but it's not a, a phrase that many people use these days, you know, and uh, you don't see many biohackers. <laughs> right. The term way of being. You know? <laughs> when they're selling their products, they, they, they're they like, we'll improve your performance, but they're not like, we'll improve your way of being. Mm -hmm. But I think it should. It should be part of it for sure. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it, I'm talking about personality structure. I'm talking about um, worldviews, um, ways of processing the world and ways of being in the world and interaction and in relation to others. Mm. So 
let's get to the the hierarchy specifically and the differences between what we understand commonly as a pyramid versus like this sailboat yeah. version of understanding it. Yeah. So many people are probably familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs is depicted as a pyramid. Uh, have you seen the, the sure? <laughs> yeah. I won't see the yeah, pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> Do I don't know if we have one of those things where you can like put in the interview like a mm. picture of something, but we could find that. <laughs> You know, so at the bottom, you have like the basic need of like safety and then uh, belonging uh, above that and self-esteem above that and then self-actualization above that as though life is some sort of linear sort of trek up some mountain or something. And um, and you reach some basic level of a certain need, like a need for connection. And then there's some voice from above. It's like, congrats, you've unlocked you know, self-esteem, you know, or family. Right, (laughs) moving on to the next stage of the video game. Next stage of the video game. Yeah. Well, first of all, Maslow never drew a pyramid in any of his writings. As I'm going through, and I trust me, I I think I read like everything he's ever written, including his like 2,000 page, two volume journal, personal journals. He never drew a pyramid. Uh, So I was like, where's the pyramid? Um, And he never thought about life as a video game either. So that's a misunderstanding of his theory of motivation. Um, it's much better to think of life as a two-step forward, one-step back dynamic. You know, we have to choose the growth option over and over again and consciously make those choices. But there's lots of forces, subconscious forces within us, as well as lots of forces outside of us that we can't control. And luck also plays a big factor in this. Mm -hmm. That is pulling us in directions that are not for our full growth. So I thought a sailboat would be a better metaphor for for that kind of way of life. So the thing with the sailboat metaphor is what's important is the integration of the whole unit. First of all, it's not uh, you're not like climbing up a mountain. It's like how do all the parts of the sailboat work together, and are they harmoniously working together? Are you fighting this like civil war with inside inside yourself? That's a phrase Maslow used. You know, does it feel like you're constantly like wanting to do this, but then something another side is you pulling you in another direction? Mm-hmm. Um, but also with an integrated sailboat metaphor, you have the boat itself which represents the needs, the basic needs. If you have too many holes in the boat, you're not going anywhere, right? You're gonna be focusing all your energies on getting the water the heck out of the boat, right? It's similarly, if you're hungry, right? You're not able to focus on much Mm -hmm. else. (laughs) If you're really chronically hungry. Um, If you're lonely, you know, we know how much that affects your whole cognition, your ability to self-actualize. If you're very, very low in, you feel like everything you do, you're not getting respect, right? Um, and that's not just narcissists who want respect, by the way. It's a really fundamental human motive. Um, I think we overuse the term narcissist these days, by the way. Like everyone's a narcissist except you, right? <laughs> it's like everyone, <laughs> oh, my, ex, my ex-husband, he's a narcissist. Yeah. Or the, oh, that my boss, and, you know, it's like we don't look within. But I think the the person who is chronically lacking the ability to enact their plans in life over and over again, that creates a toll. And, um, and that's a really human thing if you're really constantly coming up against those walls to focus all your energies on that. But again, that's going to get in the way of your growth. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the boat. But eventually, if you can get to a certain level, um, uh, not level, I shouldn't even use the word level, but you, you get to, uh, uh, in your life, you get to a place where there really uh, aren't these significant holes in your boat and you really feel you can move. You're moving. Um, uh, you eventually need to open up that sail. And the opening up the sail, that's that's where the growth happens. Um, because once you open up that sail, you're going to be vulnerable to the winds, to the waves. Um, there's a vast unknown of the sea. The waves can come crashing down on all of us at once. Um, and then we were like, we thought we were going in our own direction. And then we realized, well, we're all in the sea mm-hmm. together. Um, or we thought we we're going in a direction and then we will have to change direction, you know, um, like so many of us had to do with COVID, right? Um, but opening up that sale, that's that's where the growth happens. Yeah, what I like about that is it acknowledges all of the many things over which we have no control yeah. that at any moment could capsize us, right? Mm-hmm. And put us back at the very bottom of that hierarchy. But at the same time, there's kind of an elevated notion here as well, because when you raise the sail, if the seas are calm and the wind is blowing in your direction, you actually don't have to do anything. The mm-hmm. wind carries you, right? Mm-hmm. There's this kind of invisible spiritual alignment when you are self-actualizing in the manner in which you are designed to, where, and I say this all the time, like the universe will conspire to support you in in mysterious ways. And that can all go terribly wrong an hour later, but mm-hmm. you know, there are those heightened moments that I've experienced in my life. And I love that the analogy kind of 
contemplates that. For sure. And that's, those are transcendent. I would call those transcendent moments. Mm. Yeah. Or um, the, I'm sure you've, uh, you know a lot about the flow state in your personal life. Mm. You certainly know a lot about the flow state. Um, and uh, that is a, just such a feel magical. Yeah. You get in the flow state with humans, fellow humans too, right? Like you do probably you, all the time on your podcast. You yeah, can, for sure. Yeah. Or you finish and, and you're like, well, that was three hours. And they're like, what? Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always aspire yeah. to achieve that. Yeah. But I look at this as, you know, a mental model for uh, making sense of the world and, and, and a, a means by which to take control over, you know, kind of how you're thinking about how you're pursuing your life. Um, and I can't help but, think of it in comparison to 12 step, which is a model that, mm. you know, is kind of like a default mode in, in my mind mm. for how I try to understand the world. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there are kind of active things that you do within 12 step, the amends and the daily inventory and, and spiritual practices, but there's also this notion of acceptance and, and surrender. And mm. when you were talking about Maslow's um, heart attack, what was interesting about that was that you would think that that would put him lower on the hierarchy because suddenly his security is being threatened because mm -hmm. he's being uh, confronted with his mortality. And yet it has the opposite impact on him, which he found sort of interesting and confusing at the time. But what I see in that is, is kind of an, an embrace of, of these things that we don't have control over that allow us to reach a higher state of appreciation and and gratitude and and presence. Absolutely, but there's also like um, a whole paradox uh, that we can go down this whole rabbit hole, which is really a big mystery I try to solve in my book. And that's this, how come there are some people when they experience these moments of near-death experiences in life or threats to their mortality, they feel transcendence like Maslow did, but there are those that um, have this mortality salience all the time and they're constantly stuck in the deficiency realm of human existence. Mm. So that was a big question I tried to uh, resolve and I only got to it in the last chapter. <laughs> so I don't know if you want me to do a spoiler alert of like, I had to get sort through a lot of the literature to get yeah. to this, to explain this and to understand it. No, I want to hear it. <laughs> okay, I'll just go right to it. <laughs> uh, but just for people to know this- I mean, it's not like a thriller, you know, or it's like, how's it going to end? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wrote it kind of like a thriller. <laughs> <Yeah. but, yeah. laughs> it is a story, but yeah. I, as yeah. I said to you before the podcast, it's a it's a love letter. Also, it is, yeah, for sure. Um, the way I resolved it, because um, in in one in one way, I do want people to read the book and like for things to build on each other, like mm -hmm. really bit by bit. But I think that what I what I realized um, after sorting through all this literature is that uh, there's a certain privilege that Mazel had by. Uh, having a near-death experience, but having his security needs met when he had that. And I think that's key to being able to experience transcendence because there are people who live under really impoverished conditions where every day of their life, they don't know if they're going to survive. And it's not like they are experiencing transcendence every day, right? Um, they really are focused their attention on surviving. Mm -hmm. So I think it's one of those things where um, if you can... Um, harmoniously integrate lots of these lower needs in your life and satisfy them in a certain degree. They're, they're no longer part of your consciousness. And you can have a near-death experience. You really can have some of the highest heights of transcendence imaginable. But I don't think that it's necessarily the case for everyone. And so a big part of what I try to do in this book as well is to understand, um, you know, what are the conditions upon which we really can have um, some of the most uh, magical states of consciousness in the world. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't really point out that that isn't the case for everyone. Mm -hmm. And not everyone even has that opportunity for, for experiencing um, those highest heights of transcendence. Prophets walk among us. As a writer and podcaster for nearly 10 years, I've become more convinced than ever that our world is populated by scores of beautiful and brilliant people who have amazing stories to share. Those that we don't know who can teach us something new and leave us all the better for the experience of their sharing. And so I've dedicated my career to tracking down the most compelling prophets on the planet, going deep with each of them on my podcast to elucidate the best of what they have to offer and to sharing the insights gleaned for the benefit of all. 
But the podcast is not the only medium by which to share their stories, which is why I'm proud to announce the release of my new book, Voicing Change, Volume 2. More than mere words on paper, Voicing Change is a physical manifestation of the magic, inspiration, and timeless wisdom that transpires each week on the Rich Roll Podcast. The first edition of Voicing Change was a beautifully rendered book worthy of display on any coffee table. And volume two follows in that tradition by showcasing even more of my favorite conversations in an elegant publication replete with interview excerpts, essays, and stunning photography, making for an exquisite companion to the first volume or a satisfying standalone work. And every copy comes with a chance of winning our golden ticket sweepstakes. Six golden tickets will be hidden within a handful of books and will unlock a treasure chest of cool gifts donated by several of our sponsors. See official rules for details. Picking up this book allows you to revisit the wisdom of your favorite everyday prophets and physically interact with the life-changing ideas contained within. Voicing Change Volume 2, available now while supplies last for a limited time. Order your copy today only at richroll.com. Let's walk through just the process of self-actualization as you understand it. I think everybody wants to self-actualize, but I don't know that people have the necessary tools to understand what that framework is and a methodology for approaching their life in a, in a kind of conscious and intentional way to achieve that. That is a great practical question. <laughs> that yeah. is like uh, really important. Um, this aligns with, a, I'm trying to start a form of coaching I'm calling self-actualization coaching, um, where the purpose of, of the coaching process to help the client find a life that works best for them, find a life that um, is not something they feel like they need to, or they should be a certain way because of societal pressures, because of everyone's telling them to do certain things, but really getting in touch with your um, these potentialities within you that which when realized make you feel most alive in life, make you feel most aspired, make you feel um, just a great, great sense of calling or purpose. So as far as I'm concerned, um, living a self-actualized life is a constant uh, direction, but not it's not a designation you ever mm-hmm. achieve. Same with transcendence. You know, that would suck if like it was a destination you get there, then what do you do the moment after you transcend yeah. It's like, what do I do the rest of my life? Right? Well, there's that <laughs> adage, you know, before enlightenment, you know, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, exactly. chop wood, carry water. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, so it's a constantly process of like choosing growth, but what does it mean to choose growth? What do I mean by choosing growth? I mean, what does it mean to choose the option that is moving you in um, in directions that you really truly um, want to move in, um, and but also it's a whole process of getting in touch with well, what is that? What are those most alive centers of yourself? Because I think there's lots of internal forces that pull you away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, there are external forces, but I'm actually really, uh, to extent, more interested in the internal forces. There are so many ways we hold ourselves back. Uh, we don't even realize it in the, throughout the course of our lives and and, and like self-destructive things we do. And um, so much of like choosing the growth, it's, so it's not just so easy. Just choose, just choose the growth option. You'll be fine. No, there's so many parts of ourselves that don't want us to choose the growth option. Um, again, it could come down like guilt for or shame. Shame's a big one. Shame is such a big one. You know, um, how to live a, a real fully actualized life. You know, so much of us um, have even a fear of succeeding. Uh, it's called the, Maslow called it the Jonah complex. You know, the fear of growth. Mm-hmm. A lot of people have that. Uh, a lot of people um, don't, you know, they really want to do great things, but they are very scared of what would happen if they were put in a position to do it. Um, what if they suddenly had that microphone? What if they had all these people listening and suddenly that's when, the, you know, all the trolls come mm-hmm. running. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they, they come running, you know? And uh, so there's lots of, there's lots of aspects of the self actualization process um, that can be worked on. I think like there should exist a coaching program that is along those lines. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I feel like that should be built into young people's curriculum yes. as a means of better understanding themselves how can we make better better decisions about what we want to do if we're completely? I, th- I think disconnection from self is epidemic. Most people are disconnected from self. They don't understand what their impulses are telling them. They have low self worth. They're just they're you know the external forces distract us from ourselves, right? 
Um, but then we have all these internal mechanisms, as you mentioned, like mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not worthy, or I don't deserve that, or I'm just trying to pay the bills, or you don't understand how difficult my life is. All these barriers and obstacles that we erect that insulate us from feeling compelled to do that internal excavation, to you know, kind of parse what makes you tick and what it is that makes you wake up in the morning and get excited about anything. Like the common thing that I'm sure, sure you hear all the time is, I don't know what my passion is. I don't know, what's my purpose? Mm -hmm. How do you begin to unpack that in an individual so that they can start making tiny actions in the direction of exploring that? Yeah, I very much view it from like a Viktor Frankl lens of it's more about calling than purpose. The thing with purpose, it sounds like something so internal. Like I gotta or find- Or grandiose. Grandiose. Yeah. I gotta find that thing that I can, only I, you know, can. Well, actually, if you listen and talk to people and just um, open your eyes, you'll see there are a billion callings all around you that you could pick, just pick one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what I say to my students um, uh, when I was teaching at, at Columbia, just, uh, you know, because the students all the time would say like, how do I know what my purpose is? It's like, calm down. First of all, you're 20 years old. <laughs> you're 20 years right, old. Right, but it's not their fault yeah. because yeah. all of the external forces are telling them that they need to have I agree. an understanding of their life at that age. I agree, but it's also heartbreaking when you see how stressed they are that they haven't found their purpose yet. Mm. It's like, first of all, calm down. There's 50 year olds that still are freaking out. They don't have found their purpose. Like, But the thing is, there are so many things that you can just pick, you know, like look outside of yourself to what are needs um, that are being unmet in others. It's not all about your own un unmet needs. It's what are the unmet needs of others that you can help fulfill. Mm. And that only you, uh, that, that you do have like a unique skill set to do so and does make you feel like you come alive. Certainly, I'm not suggesting that you, you pick anything, but there are so many callings that potential callings, if you're really truly listening, if you're really truly getting outside yourself, if you're, you know, just read the news. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> read the news. You could help just give some aid to people right now in the Ukraine, you know? Like that's could be your calling. And that's 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 all I mean by purpose. I think we 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 put way too much pressure on people to find the purpose within themselves and far less pressure to be able to find a, a purpose outside of yourself that you can contribute to. Mm. Well, an important distinction there is is this um difference between finding your purpose in this self-serving manner, right? Like that is um, responsive to our culture, which is accumulate materialism. Like how can I get mine and power and money and, and, and luxury and comfort and all of that mm -hmm. versus this service component, which is a true driver of happiness, right? But is counterintuitive to the Western mindset, which mm -hmm. is looking to gird their own loins and not looking out from a perspective of how can I contribute? Maslow had this phrase he called um, dichotomy transcendence. I love it. I'm trying to bring it back. <laughs> Wait, say <laughs> like dichotomy ever, transcendence? Yeah, I say bring it back. It's not like it was ever part of the societal oh, right, lexicon, yeah. but it had a, well, it had a moment. <laughs> I know, know that's what I'm saying. In, like in 1966. I don't, think it ever, <laughs> I don't think it ever did. Even that, there's so many nerdy things in Maslow's writings mm -hmm. that only a true nerd like myself would <laughs> actually appreciate. But, um, but dichotomy transcendence, um, is something I think so important in the world right now. And what that is, is we we put so many things um, as opposites of each other. We're seeing in the political warfares, we're seeing in, in, in religious, um, but we do in, in other ways, just like male, female, um, evil, good, selfish, unselfish. Um, I wanted to encourage people to, to think about the fact that there are lots of parts of humanity that um, there's a larger whole, um, that we can actually rise above and go to a higher state of consciousness where we view all these things more objectively. I don't think anything is good or bad by itself. You know, aggression can be integrated in a really beautiful way to help you change the world for the good, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's not like you're not gonna curb your aggression, right? Um, no, it's about the integration. Um, so the reason why I bring this up with what you just said is I actually don't like to think of the word selfishness as bad, necessarily bad. And I, I wrote a paper um, a scientific paper where I created two scales to really investigate this scientifically, where I made the case that we need a construct called healthy selfishness, and we need to um, do more research on pathological altruism. And so the title of my paper was Two Forms of Paradoxical Selfishness, because I wanted the field to kind of look at this in a different way. And I created this scale, and I found out that paradoxically, 
the more you have a healthy form of selfishness where you take care of yourself, where you, um, what, what you're doing in your, in your life, um, yeah, it's benefiting you, but it, it also just happens to benefit others at the same time, you know, mm-hmm. just spontaneously. Um, but the people who have higher forms of healthy selfishness actually have more higher, uh, paradoxically, cor- um, have higher genuine motive motives for helping others, real genuine mm. motives for helping others. They love to see other people grow. They love to see other people um, uh, succeed. It's not all about themselves. Um, even though they scored higher on this self, these kinds, some of these kinds of items can be viewed selfish, but they're really healthy forms of selfishness. Selfishness, vice versa. I think we kind of act in our society like um, there's so much pressure, like give, give, give all the time. There's all this pressure to like, um, you know, sacrifice yourself. And I, I call BS on that. And I, I think it's problematic when we live in a culture where there's too much pressure to sacrifice yourself. Um, that can lead to all sorts of really um, like significant psychopathologies. You find people that scored high on our psych- our pathological altruism scale, like have items like, I need to be needed, like I um, help all the time, like 24 seven helping people. Mm-hmm. Aren't I such a good person? I'm helping. And we found that scale was correlated with depression. That scale was correlated with narcissism. It, that's the paradoxical part of it. You know, seemingly, path seemingly altruistic items yeah. were actually correlated quite strongly with a form of narcissism I've been studying called vulnerable narcissism, which um, is different from grandiose narcissism. So I just wanted to look at this in a different way, you know, if that makes sense. Um, right. But yeah. the constant in that is yeah. is ego and and and, see, and a sort of yeah. inflated sense of self-importance, right? If I'm not right. this martyr and I'm giving everything that I have, that the world will stop spinning on its axis. Correct. That's why that's unhealthy selfishness. Um, but I think we can differentiate that kind of unhealthy selfishness from a healthy form of selfishness. So selfishness need not be bad uh, mm-hmm. or be egoistic. It need well, not we be need egoistic. a different word then because selfish, fair, fair selfish <laughs> is so negatively connotated. It is. Like you need it a is. different word for that. I mean, self-care, right. right? Like you can't be the best servant unless you're first looking after yourself, right? Good point. Well, and that does feel indulgent for some people. to redefine the dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> no, good point, right. good point. <laughs> um, I think for a lot of people, it's like, well, that, I, you know, like let's pick a, Take a single mom who's working three jobs and has a bunch of young kids at home, right? Like I don't feel yeah. I have the time or the bandwidth or or it doesn't feel right to me to take care of myself because so many yeah. other people are dependent on me and I have to go out and do all this <clears throat> other stuff. Yeah, no, that that's totally fair. There is this egoistic self excess, excessive self-focus, excessive self-focus, uh, that is very much related to narcissism. But I'm very interested in this kind of vulnerable form of narcissism. It's something that really fascinates me and I, I've been trying to do more research on because it's not what we typically think of when we think of narcissism. Um, and it can be covert. Actually, in the 50s, 50s and 60s, the psychoanalysts called it covert narcissism. Um, grandiose narcissism is what we're obviously seeing a lot of in the media, right? We're seeing mm-hmm. the, the chest thumping, sort of like, oh, I'm the best. I'm going to invade a whole country because I'm the best. That's grandiose narcissism. And that has its own problems for sure. Um, but there are some of these other forms um, that are very much, uh, those are the ones that a lot of them end up on this clinician's couch. I want to have empathy for it. You know, I mean, is that just a bad thing for us to have empathy for, for people who score high on narcissism? Because they're, they're being so self-destructive in their own self-actualization goals. If my goal is to help everyone self-actualize, we need to look very non-judgmentally and with unconditional positive regard at people who are having all sorts of things that are just getting in their own way internally. Mm-hmm. Um, I see vulnerable narcissism and grandiose narcissism as well as things that are really, people are just getting in their own way. You know, it, it, things are not going to turn out well for Putin. Um, you know, I don't know if we can like bring current events mm-hmm. in what we're talking yeah, about, sure. but things are not going to turn out well. Um, and, uh, thing, uh, and there's going to be a lot of destruction along the way, a lot of unnecessary deaths. Um, and I just think that we need to, if, if we could, if I could just sit down, <laughs> if I could just sit down with Putin, I'd be like, dude, <laughs> What you're like, do you want to do you want to live a life of meaning of like growth of satisfaction at all in your life? You know, like you're not making the growth oriented choices. Yeah, and how do you uh, like if you had to clinically diagnose him and his motivations and what's driving him? There's a to rule make against these... us doing that by the APA. There's a They're rule really? that psychologists, yeah, they like they bring like the FBI to your room if you do. Oh wow! <laughs> and no, no, I'm joking about that part, but but there is a rule. There is like an ethical standard that if you're a psychologist, you're not supposed to diagnose public figures. With that said, <laughs> with yeah, can that you said, theorize? With that said, um, I wrote 
before Trump was elected, I wrote an article for Scientific American um, trying to explain to everyone, like, look, this is exactly how he thinks. This is exactly what's going to happen if you elect him as president. I was right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was right. Um, it was that narcissistic of me to say that. But, um, uh, but uh, you know, I think it's very important uh, without putting specific psychiatric labels on people we haven't formally diagnosed as psychologists. We still absolutely, um, you can see the rings on the wall with the way, the certain pattern, the ways of being. Again, it comes back to ways of being. There's a certain way of way of being that Putin has, a certain way of being that Trump has, there's a way of being. Well, everyone in Biden has. I don't mean to just pick on, you know, one thing like, um, or one sort of political venue because there's a lot of problems every which way you look um, with ways of being uh, on the political spectrum. But I think that there, um, there's a certain um, megalomaniac uh, sort of way of uh, worldview, of way of seeing the world that is just so destructive, but it's also so self-destructive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it, it's not doing good for anything. <laughs> right, and what's interesting is that is the lack of self-awareness around that, right? Like the, Total it's, it's evident to someone like yourself how this is gonna play out because that way of being is, is, is fairly accurate in terms of behavior prediction mm -hmm. and the actions he's gonna take next. And yet, whether his advisors are pointing this out to him or not, he's unable to see it for himself. Or if it is pointed out to him, he refuses to acknowledge it or to act on that information. And I'm sure it's more complicated than, uh, you know, I wish your mother loved you better. Or whatever, <laughs> you, know, whatever. Um, you know, whatever hot takes are happening on the on the internet, but yeah. it is fascinating. To, I saw that video too, by the way. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. That, that poor it's pretty woman funny. was maligned. Yeah, yeah. The internet ganged up on her pretty yeah. severely yeah. for that. Mm. Um, but if you could, are you allowed to say, like if you could sit down with him and say, look, man, here's what you need to think about right now. What would you say? I mean, I I I think like, what if I was his coach? <laughs> yeah. What if I was a self-actualization coach? Um, you know, really to understand well, what are your goals? Um, and what I try to do in a very non-judgmental way with whatever client, what are your goals? And if there are goals that things I personally wouldn't agree with or wouldn't uh, really like, um, they're not gonna. I'm still trying to be non-judgmental. Non you know. So like, if I had him as a client, I would be, and he was like, my goal is to. Uh, rule the world. It's like, okay, okay. Um, not unconditional positive regard. I'm not going to judge that. But like, what are the best things you could be doing to, 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 to along those lines? Um, he, I, I feel as though, you know, he made a huge error by, um, by so robustly and dramatically attacking a whole, <laughs> it, it, to, to all the world to see. There was, there was no strategy there. You know, for mm -hmm. someone who's supposed to be such a good chess player, I think he, at one point he says he's like the grandmaster of thinking about strategy of war and stuff. This wasn't very good strategy, you know? Like, I would probably sit down with him. Now, I wouldn't want to like, co you know, like be like, help him with the strategy, <laughs> but, but help him really just think through, um, based on your goals, um, you know, do you have any goal at all of growing as a human being, of being a better person? Is that at all a goal for you? You know, like, do you have any goal? Do you want to like have, um, uh, do you want to, do you probably feel every day of your life? And I pro he probably feels a lot of inner conflicts, right? Um, or maybe not. Uh, again, I'd, I'd be curious to know. Um, do you ever feel like there are things pulling you in different directions with, inside of you that you want to harmonize in any way? You know, and the process of, of inner feeling comfortable within your own self and not feeling you have to constantly prove something. You know, in coaching, we have something called powerful questions, right? So what are powerful questions that you can ask to help transform a person? I think a really powerful question, you know, in asking all of us, you know, is um, are there inner conflicts within you that if they were resolved, this big grandiose motivation you have would be quelled? Because hmm. I do think in, for most of us, yes, they would. We, we often find there are a lot of grandiose, narcissistic dreams and goals we had at one point, which we just totally don't have anymore because we've done inner work. Not We haven't invaded a country to solve mm -hmm. that problem. I would also ask him as a powerful question, if you get what you want, you get your goal, do the thought experiment, will, how will you actually feel any different inside, internally? So these kinds of questions where you really try to help um, and you work starting from within as opposed to from without. I don't feel like humans are very good at 
predicting how they're gonna feel when they get the thing that is driving them. That's because true we all too. think that that is gonna satisfy yeah. a certain need and it's only upon arrival that we realize it's, it doesn't. And then we just double down and yeah. keep climbing that ladder yeah. uh, you know, ad infinitum. Daniel Gilbert has done great work on that, you know, uh, effective forecasting. We're terrible effective forecasters. Connection's a big piece here too, right? Like when you're talking about Putin, I'm wondering what, what are his relationships really like, right? And connection being integral in this, in this hierarchy. You, you use, you know, Ikaria as an example, the centenarians who are so um, inextricably wed to each other and how that creates a level of, of contentment and, 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 and purpose in their lives that uh, is like a life force, right? Mm. Um, that spills over into every positive emotion that we all want to experience. And you think of someone like Putin, isolated, you know, probably keeps, you know, whoever he's exposed to at a minimum. And he's just an example. It can be, you know, think of your own life and what your relationships are like. And I've done a lot of work around this recently <clears throat> because, you know, I've realized that I haven't been as good a friend as I could mm. to, you know, my friends out there because I have kids in this work and this is my social life is sort of doing what we're doing right mm. now. Um, and I feel that missing in my life. Like that's an incongruity that, that I know I need to resolve in order to continue on this, you know, self-actualization, you know, trajectory. That's amazing that you have that awareness though. And I mean, you've made that understanding, you have that understanding, that's something you need to work on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if we ever stop finding things to work on, that's a boring life. You know, like I think that I- It never I'm, ends. It never you ends. Know. And I don't understand what, some people come in with the goal that it will end. Like some clients, right? Like, or it's just, just people have this notion. Again, like it's like a, a hierarchy, a, a pyramid. A I, need a, I need to check a few boxes. Yeah. It's always good to have something that mm. you're, that's good <laughs> that you're <Yeah>. working on. <laughs> the other thing in thinking about the hierarchy um, and reading your book and reflecting on on my own path that I found interesting was that I made certain decisions that probably should have come later on this evolutionary arc, but out of pain and necessity um, was trying to kind of expedite it. Like I was in a situation where some fundamental needs were not being met. Like we were having a really hard time just paying the bills. Mm. And logic would dictate like, hey, you should maybe go back to a law firm and get a stable paycheck. Mm. And yet I made the choice to pursue these creative things as a different way out that ended up taking a lot longer and were very precarious and, and risky at the time. And luckily like everything worked out fine, but it wasn't like a, a kind of lockstep rational model for you know, progressing through these various stages. But the, you definitely chose the growth option though. Uh, and again, like self-actualization, oh, I don't think I made this point yet, but self-actualization is not the same thing as achievement. Self-actualization is not the same thing as making money. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I watched an interview with Maslow's wife, Bertha, after Maslow died. Mm -hmm. um, and Bertha said something very interesting. She said, Maslow always, uh, when I asked him, who's the most self-actualized person you, you think exists in this world? He would always say, my mom. Uh-huh. So Bertha's mom, and then she ended. Up, she described her mom as just the most loving person, the most like like oh, really comfortable in her own skin, you know, just always like lit up a room, you know, but like not very unassuming as well, not having not achieved a lot, right? Maslow could have like chosen anyone, you know, like as as a, and he chose like he mentioned Bertha's mom as a great example of a self actualized person. I think a lot of that comes down to what you yourself um, really want to do in your life. How will you feel most alive? How you feel most creative? How will you contribute the most? But part of that self actualization process, doing that, despite the pressures, societal pressures for money, despite the societal pressures to achieve, to have more Twitter following, to be an influencer on Instagram, that's a big thing these mm -hmm. days. <laughs> you know, is all that pressure. You know, you can kind of feel like a loser if you go on Instagram and like you have like you get like five likes for saying something, but you see someone who says the same exact thing you said, and they have like five hundred thousand <laughs> likes. <laughs> You could feel like a yeah. loser in life, but that doesn't mean that yeah. you're not self-actualizing. It doesn't mean that other person has self-actualized. I can't tell you the amount of people that I've talked to, just uh, like people I'm in awe of, people I think they've accomplished so much. And I talk to them and I get a beer with them or whatever, and uh, whatever the choice of drink is. And they, uh, they're they like, I'm, I'm depressed. 
Like, how the heck are right. you depressed? It, they're not, they, you know, there's still things they're doing in their life. They're not actually self-actualizing. So I think we need to do that right away. We need to divorce self-actualization from these other constructs we have that we have made in our society to be out like that mm. success. Mm. Mm. When I reflect on the people that I know that are pretty advanced on the self-actualization scale and, and you know, perhaps, you know, living a, a transcendent life, um, there's a certain energy, like when they're in the room, mm. like, you know it, right? You mm. feel it. Like this is a person who knows who they are. Mm. They're confident, but not arrogant. Mm. They have healthy boundaries, but they're also incredibly gracious and curious and loving. Yeah, They just, they know who they are and they exude uh, a, a certain kind of energy that's this mix of like love, gratitude, presence, appreciation, uh, like I said, confidence. Um, and it's almost as if there's something in the human brain that is calibrated to recognize and, and appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, I wanna be like that, Yeah. right? Yeah. What is that? They're comfortable in their own skin, and 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 you, scientifically, I can break down what that means. Yeah, I mean, they're they're not fighting a civil war within themselves. They're not fighting. They're not parts of themselves that are uh, that are going in so many different directions. I mean, you the, you can take the converse of what you just said, and you kind of like when someone walks in a room who like is fighting this oh, yeah. internal war. You're you like, know, it. holy yeah. moly! You're like, I need to get away from that person. <laughs> it's like you know, um, and those people actually tend to be the ones that tend to be very manipulative. They tend to be the ones that like. Are you like constantly scheming, you know? But I, I do find it an interesting phenomenon that those who are very, very comfortable in their own skin don't feel as much a need to manipulate others to satisfy their... It's because they're not coming from a place of deficiency. Mm -hmm. They're coming from a place of growth. Um, Maslow made this distinction between the deficiency realm of existence and the being realm or the growth realm of human existence. So many people are stuck in this deficiency realm where all their motivations... Um, are being driven by their deficiencies. And that's 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 what I'm talking about with the person who's not comfortable in their own skin because they they you know they, they'll come in a room but they, their ways are focused on like I need they know they need something so then they're searching for who can give them what everything they need. is transactional. But you're talking about are the kind of people walk in a room they just want to grow. They mm -hmm. want to play, they want to explore, you know. I love people like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. And they will be equally interested in other people, right? That yeah. curiosity. And that's very different from the person who's pretending to be interested in you because they're trying to extract something out of you. Yeah. And even if the words are exactly the same, the energy is completely different and you know it immediately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that that kind of dovetails into some interesting ideas that you have around authenticity. Like authenticity is sort of this catchphrase that love has- that topic. <laughs> yeah, been, you know, uh, sort of, I don't know, commodified, I suppose. Um, we're all aspiring to be uh, authentic and there's a high premium for people who are authentic online. So what does that actually mean? And there's some interesting science that you've written about, about perhaps, uh, you know, authenticity kind of all being uh, an improper rubric or, or perhaps just a complete fallacy. Yeah, I think there, there are a lot of things we, we use the phrase authenticity for that aren't really authenticity, you know? So there's the idea that if you just say what's ever on your mind at any point in time, like, oh, I'm just being authentic. No, uh -huh. you're being an asshole. <laughs> like, no, there's, yeah. that's the term for that is asshole, yeah. not authentic. Mm -hmm. Or the, this idea that um, uh, if you realize all your, darkest impulses all the time, you know, like you're, you're really being authentic, you know, I view authenticity, like I view everything else. So I, I said earlier that I don't think anything is really good and bad by itself. I think there's a healthy flavor to it. And there's a deficiency motivated flavor. We could say a growth oriented flavor and a deficiency motivated flavor. I think authenticity is the same. So in uh, what I try to talk about is the construct of healthy authenticity, which is how can you um, realize your potentialities in a really um, uh, in a way that you're really truthful, but is helping you learn and grow, helping people around you grow. Um, so authentic relationships, I think, are ones that are very honest, but they're ones that are honest. You're not just having an authentic relationship when you just say like, like, hey man, you're ugly. You know, like, I'm just telling the truth. I'm being your friend, tough love. Mm. No, I think like authentic relationships, truthfulness is a part of it, but I think there's a flavor of healthy authenticity where there's a genuine um, spirit and motivation that we're both here um, to help each other grow, you know, and and I want to, and you want to grow as a person. So sometimes that means that the authentic choice, in my definition, is 
having self-control over certain of your urges, um, regulating certain things you say, you know, do you have to, is like really thinking through, if I say this on Twitter right now, <laughs> is that really me being authentic or is that, is that a healthy form of authenticity? Mm -hmm. You know, is it a way that it's going to signal to the others and um, is going to help anyone? Is it going to make the world a better place? Is it going to make me grow in any way if I say it? Then don't say it. You know, so I think like healthy authenticity um, has a different flavor than deprivation motivated. Right. Them. Well, motivation is important, right? What is the motivation behind yeah. that behavior or that yeah. action? Yeah. And in order to develop self-awareness around that, you have to do enough internal work where you get a better understanding of what your presets are and your motivations and your deficiencies and your character defects and the mm -hmm. like, right? Like if you're operating impulsively or reactively to the world, you're not really in touch with your interior, the interior space that is, you know, compelling these behaviors. Mm. So how does one like, you have to, that's the work, right? Like you gotta, you gotta be able to excavate your own self to, to <laughs> understand all of that. And again, I go back to 12 step because that's the, the model that I've used to, mm. you know, we call them character defects and, and trying to understand what's behind them. Yeah, so I have like uh, various components of healthy authenticity. Two of them are ones you basically just touched on. Self-honesty and self-awareness are two huge ones. You can just work on those two to start with. Um, uh, not just you in particular, but <laughs> everyone. <laughs> not yeah. saying you need to work on those. I'm saying. <laughs> I have plenty I need to work on. <laughs> me too, me too. But I just, I, just to be clear. Um, if anyone can start working on those it, on, a, on a path to healthy authenticity, I think, I think those are good phases. There's more to healthy authenticity than those two. But if you, how many of us are really um, self-honest? You know, I did something a bit cheeky in my book, which you rarely see in a self-help space, which are like, I'm here, take this test of narcissism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> take this test of psychopathy. Are you a psychopath? Maybe you are. Maybe <laughs> you, like be really, really piercingly honest with yourself. I feel like I am constantly honest with myself and I um, do it with a sense of humor and love though. Like, you know, it's really good, I think, to laugh at yourself. I think that people, people who score real, really high on psychopathy, um, lack self humor, mm. um, and there's this is a well. The, the correlation is almost perfect. <laughs> yeah. Can you think of anyone in your head like who um, uh, is a big public figure who is like just caught like severe lack of empathy? It's so obvious they have a survive, and they and they ever laugh at themselves. You never see that, mm -hmm. you know. So I think a big part of that is self honesty, self awareness, um, and having and cultivating relationships that are grounded in truth, um, um, but grounded in truth in a way that has a direction to it, uh, a direction. And this, this, by the way, some people might disagree with that. There's, um, I get disagreements sometimes with my heterodox uh, friends, uh, intellectual friends. Right, who think put a that pin in that because we're going to talk about yeah, that, but go ahead. The idea of truth at all costs. You know, we can talk about that because yeah. I actually disagree with that. Um, I think truth, I'm not saying lying is good, but we don't have to say everything. <laughs> we right. don't have to do everything. Um, I think cultivating a real authentic relationship where you genuinely care and are listening to uh, the other person um, divorced from your own real felt needs, right? So it's not like you're, it's not you're always trying to get something out of the other person. You're actually with wonder and curiosity witnessing a friend, um, I think is a big part of an authentic relationship. And in your experience, how malleable are these traits? Curiosity, empathy, like these things, you know, we come with our presets obviously, and there are things that we can do to cultivate or breed them. But, you know, somebody who is pathologically narcissistic and lacks any kind of empathy, is it possible for that person to become more empathetic? Or how do we cultivate these traits that can, you know, elevate us on this self-actualization path? Well, that's a billion dollar question right yeah. there. <laughs> if I had the magic sauce and if we could put it in the water supply, you know, for everyone to have. Um, but I think a lot of it does come down to a matter of perspective. Um, it comes down to a matter of um, frame of reference. Uh, there are self-transcendent states we get in their self-transcendent practices that allow us to glimpse moments of what that could look like. Um, aided or unaided by drugs. You know, I'm not, uh, not anti-drugs by any stretch of the imagination. There's some really exciting research coming out mm -hmm. about psychedelics, um, the extent to which it can change our frame of reference. But I think an even more interesting question is how can we get those states of consciousness without having to take, um, you know, 
whatever your, your, your psychedelic drug of choice is. And I think there are things that we can do. I'm really interested in the, uh, the emotion and psychological phenomenon of awe, A-W-E. Uh, it's a it's a it's a concept uh, I've scientifically studied uh, with people like Dr. Keltner and uh, David Yaden, uh, trying to create a scale and having people report on their experiences of awe. So we did a large scale study where we had people just free form tell us about your greatest moments of awe and try to collate and find the commonalities and we create a scale the all experience questionnaire based on that had six facets to it. But the point here is that when you look at these descriptions of the all state, you find that um, they're they're infused with other um, with getting outside yourself. They're infused with ideas of a complete shift in perspective. In some cases, a quite profound shift in perspective, like things like, "Wow, my whole life, I thought that like it, this was my path, or I thought that the world only worked in this way, and then I discovered or witnessed something that was so beyond my comprehension, so outside of myself." that I realized I had been so self-focused this whole time. So I think we can we can get these moments. Um, some people, religious people, may find it in prayer. Um, uh, meditation practices show a lot of pro- promise in it. There are a whole wide range of, um, you call them spiritual practices mm-hmm. or transcendent practices. I like to secularize it, you mm-hmm. know, uh, but pairing it with, um, uh, sometimes even pairing it with psychedelics has been found to show huge, huge positive effects. Right. The psychedelics will deliver you a guaranteed response, yeah. right? That you're going to have to reckon with. But there are all these other modalities for tapping into that. I mean, you, you know, the Grand Canyon, right? You talk about mm-hmm. these different various peak experiences that we can have. I've experienced them as an athlete. I've experienced them in 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 meditation and in other contexts in my life. Um, but uh, also. Is, is not like connection to other human beings, back to the connection piece, like mm-hmm. being in communion with other human beings, the ultimate breeder of empathy, because the more people you're connected to or the more cultures and, and also travel and exposure to different things is gonna, is gonna you know, make you a more empathetic human. The, the, the broader you can develop your understanding of the human condition. Yeah, empathy and compassion are different things. Um, and I think that is an important distinction uh, a lot of people call themselves, have you heard people who call themselves, they self-identify as empaths? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. We did a study on yeah. that. <laughs> You're going to love this. <laughs> yeah. We found actually that, that that's core with narcissism. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that's the whole, the, the spiritual narcissism <laughs> yeah. thing that yeah. you've oh, written I love about, that which is a super yes. interesting topic I because topic. I'm, you know, I'm kind of part of that you know, I, I'm, I'm tangential to that world. I'm very familiar with the condition that you're talking about. There. Yeah, and I also want to make clear before I get hate mail from empaths, <laughs> which is mm-hmm. funny, and that idea is funny in itself that I would get hate mail from empaths, but um, that I'm not talking about all, perfect correlation. I'm not talking about all oh, everyone who's also identified empaths is really narcissist. I'm not saying that, so calm down, empaths. Um, you can There are people who are generally have an abundance of empathy. They, they immediately feel what other people feel like. Um, and they, it can be overwhelming for them because they are constantly have very little boundaries between self and others, and that 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 can really exist. But there are, um, you know, there are those who self-identify as empaths that um, that that have this notion that like they're really special in some really like narcissistic mm-hmm. way. Like I'm a real healer, but no one, you know, I'm. By the way, you f- you find that the higher proportion of this among those who call themselves healers. Again, not all, mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's this idea that like. I and only I can save you, right? And then there, there's a gr- kind of grandiosity there that, that may not take into account the real felt needs of another person. But I think compassion is a little bit different. Um, with compassion, you might you don't have to feel what another person is feeling to want to alleviate their suffering because you see the suffering right in front of your eyes. I, you can be more in tune with the real felt needs of others. There are a lot of people who, um, in a narcissistic way, view themselves as healers or helpers but they're actually causing destruction in the person they're helping because they're not paying real attention to whether or not what they're giving the other person is actually what the person needs. It's actually more, it's correlated with intrusive um, ways of intrusive helping. Hmm. There's a whole concept in psychology called intrusive helping. Um, uh, My mom does this sometimes. I love her so much, but she'll be like, she'll like mail me like all these food, like all this stuff. She's like, see what I did. I gave you all this. I was like, I don't even want half of this. You know, it's like, (laughs) I mean, God bless her, right? Like she's right. wonderful. But like, just to give you an example, like like sometimes we do things 
for to make ourselves feel good. But we need to actually ask, is that really what is really in best for someone else? Mm -hmm. I think compassion is really being able to look at um, the real felt needs of others um, and to um, really try to alleviate their suffering in a way that um, even if you don't feel what they're feeling, because sometimes we get in all sorts of trouble by um, thinking that we know exactly what someone else is feeling. We're presuming that, well, we just get exactly what someone needs because we mm -hmm. feel what they feel, you know, and we're not really doing them the best uh, good for themselves. Or we're approaching it from a perspective of trying to meet our own needs. Like yeah. you can tell yourself that you're trying to help your friend, but really what you're trying to do is make yourself like, oh, if I solve this person's problem, then I have fulfilled some need within side myself it's deficient that has motivation. nothing to do with that person's need right yeah it's like a deficiency motivation absolutely absolutely yeah um how does trauma play into all of this i mean humanistic psychology is really about the elevated states of yeah. of the human condition yeah um how do we you know sort of ascend as opposed to uh looking at you know clinical uh deficiencies in humans per se but it, i feel like yeah. We live in these loops that are calcified when we're young and these stories that we tell ourselves about who we are. And we're unconsciously aware that so much of our worldview and behaviors are originate from something that happened to us before we were complete, you know, our brains were fully formed, mm. et cetera. So when you're thinking about these elevated states, like, do you not have to still rely upon, you know, different modalities of psychology to um, help people, you know, unpack those things in a more traditional mode to get to that place. I didn't say that very elegantly, but do you there's know what I lot, mean? There's just a lot there in what you just said. Like there's a lot there, a lot to unpack. Different modalities. Yeah, because- I mean like CBT, yeah. like, you know, yeah. it, you know what I'm saying? I do. And it's just such a complicated, complex question because Believe it or not, we haven't all figured this out in psychology. Yeah. There, are, like it's. Believe it or not, we'd be out of a job. We don't have our shit yeah. together. <laughs> We'd be. Very, I'd be very hubristic to say, okay, here's the answer. Um, because there are different factions in psychology. There, are, there are those. There are different. You know, some people think like the, the this approach is the best. Some people to trauma. Some people think this approach is the best. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I like. I'll tell you what I like in the most. Um, modest way in the sense that it's not necessarily going to work for everyone. But I really like uh, Stephen Hayes and his ACT approach. Um, the ACT approach is grounded in the idea that uh, we need to stop avoiding our experiences that we're scared of. Avoiding, um, you know, a lot of people with trauma, what they'll do is they'll run from from any trigger, right? They're scared of being triggered, right? That's a word, triggered, right? And even you see that in college campuses with like trigger warnings and mm -hmm. research shows that backfires. Um, the best available evidence on this suggests that um, if you even set up that expectation beforehand, that like, just so you know, what I'm just about to say to you, what I'm about to say to you is gonna trigger you. That already sets, your, <laughs> that's right. already like gonna set your expectations in a way. It's basically saying you can't handle it. You know, right. what we want to do more, I think, is build deep reserves of resilience in people where they, they're they like, I can handle it. You know, I've been through a lot. And because I've been through a lot, it has strengthened me. So therefore, who cares about a couple words that might trigger me? I can handle that. You know, we want, we want people to have more resiliency. So I really like the ACT approach because it's moving uh, in an in a, in a approach-oriented way towards... Um, in line with your values. So value is a big part of the ACT mm -hmm. approach. So you're still saying, and as long as you're moving with your values, um, you, you don't avoid you don't avoid these things. Right, this is consistent with Susan David's approach, right? Emotional Absolutely. agility. As well, yeah. You have yeah. to expose yourself to these things to, it's just, it's like exercise. You have to use your muscles to get stronger. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a lot of confluence between uh, Susan's approach and the ACT approach. Mm -hmm. um, I really like, uh, well, both of them are my friends. <laughs> I, like, mm -hmm. I like both of them and I like the approach very much. Um, but this whole idea of experiential avoidance is a, is a psychological construct and has just been shown in hundreds and hundreds of studies now that it's it, in almost every context imaginable that it's just not good. Yeah. I'm thinking of people in my own life that, that practice that and, and what that's reaped in their lives yeah. and it isn't good. Yeah, it's really um, it, it, it's uh, it's correlated depression. It's correlated. It's it just you're constantly reinforcing the wound mm -hmm. as opposed to healing it. 
Um, but post-traumatic growth is a whole different field than post-traumatic uh, overcoming just post-traumatic stress. Because I think there's more that we can do to just to just go from negative ten to zero. You know, um, you know, uh, some people will go to a clinician and their goal, their stated goal, be I just want to stop having ruminations about the event, the trauma. I want to just stop feeling so shitty all the time. But I think we can do better than you're you're cured when you just stop those things. I think we can go to the positive 10, positive 20, and actually grow from those experiences in really profound ways, like seeing a real fundamental reordering, reshaping of your priorities in life, um, feeling a greater sense of connection to others and a greater sense of love for humanity, um, uh, uh, creative, creative growth. You know, you find lots of different areas people can grow from these traumas in really profound ways. Mm. Shame is a big issue in terms of getting people to confront it's this huge. stuff, right? For everything. Yeah. So can, I just, can I double click on shame for a second? Yeah. I, yeah. I think it is uh, the one thing that's in common, or at least neurot the personality trait neuroticism has, but shame is a very strongly correlated with neuroticism. It's the one thread that runs through every form of diagnosis in the DSM. Uh-huh. <laughs> if you had to find one thing to unravel where all, you know, shame, neuroticism, you know, negative emotions. Um, but shame is such a big one because the moment you start to accept self, real radical self-acceptance for, for a part of yourself you don't like, it doesn't become an issue anymore. Right. That's one of the most powerful things about being in 12-step. Mm -hmm. When you sit in these rooms and you see people get up in front of groups of people, large and small, yeah. and tell these insane stories about stuff that they've done and they laugh about it yeah. and they you know, inject it with all kinds of color and drama. And you just cannot believe that this person is so comfortable telling this chapter of their life that would be horrifically shameful and embarrassing to anyone else. Yeah. And what it does is it gives you the permission to look at your own relationship with shame and your past behaviors and own it in a way such that it no longer holds power over you. And when you mm -hmm. share that with other human beings, it's, it's a very attractive, infectious thing that I think is very powerful in helping other people confront their own shame. I completely agree. Can I stand up for one second? Yeah. My butt hurts. No problem. <laughs> In that super comfortable chair that I got, it yeah. is. Super you need to go to the bathroom or anything. We take a quick break. No, I just want to like you can you can capture this and yeah. You there you go. You're being filmed, Scott. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome. But I want to snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So, because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly, and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. All right, Scott had to shake his booty. Okay. Took a bathroom break. Where were we? What were we talking about? Self acceptance. Uh, but you did ask me a really good question. It was about uh, you know owning owning you know owning your behavior in a way that basically dissipates shame. Oh, man, shame is um, it plays a role in so much of the work I do in my life. Like I'm really interested in like neurodiversity, for instance. I really want to champion 
uh, people who brains are whose brains are wired in all sorts of different ways, from like autism spectrum to like uh, bipolar disorder to dyslexia, um, schizophrenia. Like like having uh, self acceptance for having a uniquely wired brain is a game changer for these individuals, right? Um, I think you're also seeing this play out more controversially in the sort of trans movement. Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of these individuals um, who have gender identities that are extraordinarily mismatched to their physical bodies. And that, by the way, that is a real scientific thing that can happen for your psychological um, uh, gender to differ so dramatically from your physical genitalia that you, you, you that experience is disorienting for, for people. The question, and what's controversial is what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. Do you call yourself a different gender or do you deal with it in other ways? And that's open for, for discussion and I think debate. But nevertheless, if you can have self acceptance over the fact that you are uh, out there, you know, on a bell curve, extreme in an extreme way, and you can get self acceptance for that, that's a huge game changer for them as well. I mean, that's what that, isn't that what we're all craving in a way? Mm -hmm. There's a sort of a common humanity there. I'm I'm trying to, even though I'm bringing up these disparate examples of these diverse examples, we're all human at the end of the day, and whenever we have any sort of extreme um, trait or something that puts us out on a bell curve, to have self acceptance for that. And to not have shame over it is is going to be a huge part of that self actualization process. Mm -hmm. Well, the self acceptance provides the basis for esteem, right? And you need that esteem in order to create a rounded sense of self and healthy boundaries. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things you talk about. Let's talk. I want to talk about love and mm. this uh, difference between. D love and B love. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I love that topic. That? Yeah, <laughs> I love that topic. Well, um, when I was looking into the writings of Maslow, I saw I came across a concept called being love, and what what does it mean to be love? Uh, you know, day in and day out, um, and he distinguished that from unneeding love. So he distinguished needing love from unneeding love. So when you have needing love, that's more like a need for connection. Like you need. Um, to connect with people all the time. You need to constantly have that sort of um, uh, find people with similar values, similar ideas. But I think be love is a higher form of spiritual love where you can love people even if you don't connect with them. You know, you, like you can be with someone even, it's the opposite. Like they have a, they're on the complete opposite end of a political spectrum from you. It, it seems unheard of these days that you could potentially you could love someone mm -hmm. who has a complete opposite end of a spectrum political spectrum, but you can, <laughs> you're, you're, there's no rule. How there's no like you. God from, you know, like <laughs> thou shalt not yeah. love thy neighbor who disagrees with you on this dimension of politics. <laughs> no, you can. And I think that um, that's why it's a way of being. It's an attitude. It's a verb, right? You know, like it's not necessarily a feeling. Yes, you might not feel love for that person, but you can be loving toward that person. Um, you can, um, I think a big part of of, of uh, be love is what's called a quiet ego, is lowering your ego just enough where you can actually listen to another person's perspective. Because when our ego is in full force and that volume is turned up all the way, we're not listening <laughs> at all no. to what the other person is saying. We're already right and they're wrong. Yeah. Most people are looking at love as something they're trying to extract from another human being. They're trying to get it. They're trying to fill some hole or some need that they have. The boat and, is, has a lot of holes in it. Yeah, and the idea being like, I will be complete when you know you complete me. Like when I meet that perfect mate and we're together, then everything is gonna be great. As opposed to this idea of be love where you're, you're exuding it, you're looking to contribute love. And I just know for myself, when I um, descend into self-obsession or I'm you know, picking my fingernails and gnawing my teeth on whatever you know, is frustrating me in the moment or why this isn't working out or whatever, mm. like I have to practice the habit of like, how can I contribute? How can I, how can I you know, exude my next encounter with, you know, something mm. positive for that person. And the more that I practice that, which is not, this is not my default state, Scott. Like I'm it's not. Know, a curmudgeon. <laughs> no, like, not at all. Um, I just know that I feel better. The other person feels better. Everything's better. Mm. And that self-obsession begins to wane. 
Mm. But it's a practice. It's mm. just like a muscle. It's a habit that I have to cultivate. And more often than not, I don't think about it or I resist doing it or I don't want to do it. I think, how can you integrate it more though into your being? Because I, I think there's probably really positive aspects of that curmudgeon guy. Like you've asked me some really uh, critical questions today, like even just coming back with me, some stuff. I wouldn't call it curmudgeon at all. That's not what I'm saying. But there, like, it's that that side of you seeps through sometimes today, and I view it as like um, a real positive, you know, because it's like you know, there's maybe it's a more critical side of you or a more like um, thoughtful. So I guess just like how can it be integrated is my question. Yeah, I mean, I think what I'm what I'm getting at more is, mm. you know, as somebody who is devoted to you know trying to self actualize mm. on some level um, i'm i'm constantly daily hourly reminded of these default sets that i have which is to not be grateful but to be resentful or you know to be uh, irritated by other human beings like you know it's like petty <laughs> shit right but no matter how much devotion i have to personal growth like this mm. this is like these are weeds that continue to grow up and probably will for the rest of my life, no matter what I do. Yeah. yeah. But the only solution is to persistently like double down on these habits or these little practices that I know keep those negative behaviors and emotions at bay and, you know, kind of present, you know, a better version of myself. And it's sort of an act as if thing, like good on you, you man. You fake it until you make it kind of stuff. Mm. And that's a whole other sticky wicket. But mm. um that seems to work for me. But I guess my question is like, does it do? It, do you ever get to a point where that um, that practice becomes second nature, and that default position is no longer the default? Like in your practice of working with lots of people over the years, have you seen that? Yeah, sometimes I do see it. Sort of an entire way of being is replaced over time through habit change, but not always the, necessarily. Like you're 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 saying to me that no matter how many podcast interviews you've done, how much you've exercised that way of being, it's still not your default. Is that what you're saying? Correct. That's fascinating. But it's also similar to, listen, if I wanna be a good runner, I gotta go out and run and train. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll never just wake up one day and be good at that thing mm -hmm. unless I'm consistently practicing it. I guess the, there's a philosophical question here, which the, no one can answer, which is, um, at what point have you changed the habits of your personality structure so much that it has now become your new personality? Right. Um, I mean, I, I'm interested. That's a broader <laughs> yeah. subject of like pers personality malleability overall. Yeah. yeah. And I've written a bit about the science of that. Um, uh, and there are limits, but we can quite profoundly change but there are biological temperaments, and I think this is what you're hinting at, that uh, that may be your, you consider your default. Um, people, I, I, I have friends, people who they say, I'm biological, I'm an introvert, but you know, in terms of the, my actions in the world, I'm very extroverted, right? Because there are people I would assume they're extroverted, mm -hmm. but they're explaining to me their inner experiences. Biologically, I'm an introvert. And that might not be something that ever goes away, right? But, but, but when you're acting extroverted and you're doing those things, is it, is it you or not you? I mean, that, that's the deep philosophical question there. And I would argue that it's still a part of, it's still part of you. It's still an authentic mm. part of you. That you're not faking it. Um, it's just that there are certain uh, default biological temperaments that uh, also exist, but uh, those only influence the sort of probabilities that you will be in a certain mode of being. Mm -hmm. But it's not saying those other modes of being aren't you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, this gets a little philosophical. Yeah. Yeah, I guess an extreme example of that or a thought experiment would be to take somebody who is on one far end of the political spectrum, like an AOC or a Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. type individual. And that person saying, okay, I'm going to now behave as if I'm the person on the complete opposite end of the political spectrum. And everything that comes out of my mouth and all the content that I consume and all the interactions I'm going to have, I am going to mimic that person on the other end of the, mm. the spectrum. If they do that long enough, do they ultimately become, become that person? Do they, do they shift or will they rubber band back to being that person that they were prior? Mm. 
I, I, as the scientist in me is saying, well, we have to do that experiment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we have to do that experiment, but I, I do think there are ways we can change and grow profoundly. But I, I think at the end of the day, um, we have to still be in line with a certain core set of values or else it won't feel authentic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wrote about this exact, I pondered this exact question. I wrote an article, a couple articles for The Atlantic about this. Can you change your personality was one, but the other one was, um, uh, I forget the title of the other one, but it was really much along that exact answering that question, looking at the research. And the research shows that you have people who, even if they're acting um, in a different way, if it's not in line with their values, they just don't feel authentic. Mm -hmm. um, there still has to be a reason for why you're doing the personality change. And often the reasons for the personality change are still grounded in your biology. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah. for me, if I, let's say I set out a goal tomorrow, I want to be a huge asshole. That's my goal. I want to completely change. I'm tired uh -huh. of people pleasing. I'm tired of, of having to smile all the time when I meet someone. It's exhausting. I want to just become the biggest asshole. And so then I just like, I look up, you know, who's the biggest ass in the world? And I mimic them all the time. Will there ever be a point where that will become authentic? And probably not. Probably mm -hmm. not. There probably is, you know, you, has, you have to change for a reason, right? And some of that does come back to who you actually biologically are to a mm. certain degree. Mm -hmm. mm, that's so interesting. It's a fascinating topic, yeah. isn't it? Now I do think I could use to be like twenty five percent more asshole and like twenty five percent less people pleaser. That I right. So I think to and certain if you're degrees, so exhausted by having to smile all the time, then <laughs> isn't your true self somebody who shouldn't be smiling all the time? Yeah. Well, I mean, I was joking about that. I actually, love smiling. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but I was just doing a thought experiment. Yeah. But yeah. you're right. You're absolutely right. You like, know, like what is authentic? And it goes back to that question of like, is authenticity a real thing? And what does that mean specifically? Yeah, I don't think there's a real self. Mm. I mean, people in the spiritual world, they always they get in touch with your real, you listen to med meditation things. I disagree with some of the things people say in these meditation apps. Like, am I allowed to disagree with it? Like, if they close your eyes, you are enough as it is. It's like, no, you're not. And they'll say things like, you know, you, <laughs> you know, your real self is all you need. It's like, no, it's not. Mm. I don't know. There, I don't know. I think, I think we let people off the hook too easily sometimes <laughs> in a spiritual space, and we don't encourage growth. You know. Yeah. But I do believe in growth as well. But I don't think there is that real self. I think there are just multitude of selves, right? And we are constantly shifting between them. We have evolutionary evolved selves, you know, like the kind of self that becomes triggered in a mating context, right? And like that has an all evolutionary foundation going way back. Is that not your true? You know, no, that's mm -hmm. a part of you. But I think we have other sides of ourselves. I think we have probably higher. We do probably have higher selves. That probably is a, is a, is a coherent construct. Not real self. You would have to believe in that if I you believe so. in Maslow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is your whole thing. Yeah. But the idea that the higher self is your real self, I don't agree with that. I think that there are lots of real, real parts of the organism. Right. You know? But we all walk around with this delta between the person we actually are and the person we aspire to we be. We aspire to be. Or, and, and maybe there's an additional delta in there between the person we are, the person we think we are, which is usually puts a positive spin on who you actually are and the person we aspire to be, right? So the person we aspire to be, being that higher self that we're all you know, consciously and unconsciously trying to work towards to reduce that delta. And then people who have really grandiose ambitions and think that they're capable, because there's something deeper there. It's not just who you want to be, it's who you think you're capable of becoming and you want to be. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, would that be a great tragedy to think in your head that you are capable, of, that you are, you could be this person, and then find out in your deathbed, like, no, you just that wasn't possible. It was never that in really the wasn't you, you, or possible to be you. And then, does it feel like you've wasted so much of your life? You know, I mean, and there, these are these are really deep, profound questions that get at the heart of of human existence and what it means to have a human existence. Yeah. But anyway, well, the, that also works in the opposite direction, mm -hmm. right? Like. Yeah. If you have some success, then your your uh, sense of personal possibility expands. Yeah, it does. It really does. Um, I mean, I'm 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 into the growth mindset. <laughs> I mean, I'm not I'm not like a fixed mindset. <laughs> what do you mean guy. you went on? You're on yeah. long walks with Angela Duckworth. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. No, we we're, we're we're down with the with Carol Dweck's work. It it makes um, sense, but um, uh, but. It's it, constantly calibrating. Yeah, Car Carol Dweck, sorry, I misspoke there. Oh, no problem, no yeah, problem. Yeah. No, but Angela uh, right. talks a lot about growth mindset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was apt, that was apt as well. Um, but um, 
con- the constant calibration process is key. Constantly grounding yourself in the reality of who you are in your pursuit of who you want to become. Mm-hmm. Because I think we can get, especially if we get power, and, and you see that, you see that, that power intoxicates you know people, makes them start to think that they're capable of becoming all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes them have decisions that actually um, do the exact opposite. Um, you know, the, it can be you can fool you into thinking you could accomplish all sorts of things that you get into this kind of mania state. Um, so, I think look, I think it's it's tricky because we we want to absolutely encourage people to dream and to have high ambitions, but we should also have them constantly calibrate who they are right now and uh, and who they really truly. Um, uh, you know, are capable of becoming, um, because in the in the long run, um, being in line with that reality will lead to a better outcome, won't it? Yeah. If you're actually in line with who you could become. Yeah, yeah. Um, back to that point that you were making about self help and um, meditation apps and your you know sort of reaction to some yeah. of those statements. Yeah. Um, there is something interesting about the inherent uh, tension between or the paradoxical kind of relationship between this idea that that expansion uh, self actualization is actually a lot of work like yeah. you, you know you're not you, you don't just get it right like you have to actually work towards it and it's yeah. something you have to apply consistently over extremely long periods of time versus this notion um, that we already have everything we need right and we just have to expand our conscious awareness and recognize it. And that is more of the ephemeral allowing kind of thing, right? So how do those two things like coexist for you? Sounds like you're you're more on the former, less on the latter. Um, yeah, it's true. Um, and and there's a, 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 I talk about this in the book Transcend, that uh, in the book Transcend, Maslow's students at Brooklyn College, um, he said they had this notion of self-actualization that it was I- impulsivity. It was just acting on your whims, just doing what you want. Uh, it was easy, you know, if you just were in line with yourself. And he made it very, very clear that self-actualization requires commitment um, and requires a lot of hard work because it's tough choosing the growth option day in and day out. You said, you know, you, you told me you were, thank you for being vulnerable, by the way. Mm. You told me your own personal struggles with that, with um, uh, your default versus you know, the person you know you're capable of and you are capable of it, right? You're right now. <laughs> this this guy in front of me is this incredibly uh non curmudgeony thoughtful, kind <laughs> human being, right? Um, so uh, it takes a lot, but it takes a lot of work. And um you, were you asking though in my own personal life? Like were you asking me personally how that plays out? No, I'm uh, it was less just more more just like theoretically, like theoretically, in how you absolutely. think about psychology in yeah. general. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, theoretically, absolutely. Um, I think there's a difference between spontaneous and impulsive. Um, I think self-actualization is is there's a certain there is a certain spontaneity there. There's a certain sort of um, playfulness and mm-hmm. um, exploration and curiosity. Um, but it's that's different than um, kind of impulsive, um, uh, not not seeing the bigger picture or the long term, or working very very hard at something that might not pay off for 10, 20 years. Um, self-actualization process in a lot of ways is being able to have that foresight and being able to work really hard towards that future vision. Yeah, I think the impulsivity thing is a really important point. The way I think about that is is someone who is saying, I am acting in alignment with my highest nature because my intuition is telling me X. Mm. But if they've short-circuited the hard work, Mm how can they trust their intuition or their instincts because they are disconnected? And this plays out in the recovery context when people are new and they've stopped drinking or using and suddenly they're just a live wire of emotions and they have no way of controlling it. Mm -hmm. Their instincts are unreliable. They're trying to solve their problems with the mind that got them there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And they're taught, we're taught, I was taught, to abdicate making big decisions and 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 making sure that you run them by you know other people because your instincts are unreliable like you have to do enough internal work before you can have a trusted relationship with whatever those impulses are telling you and i think there's a lot of people out there who believe that they are on this path towards self actualization when instead they're really just reacting to 
unconscious impulses that have been driving them all along. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does that like oh, yeah. feel oh, yeah. right to you? Oh, spot on. Yeah, spot on. Um, I'd love to double click on that 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 uh, that moment of real sheer vulnerability where you you stop doing the drug or you stop drinking and you're raw, you're emotional and it's craving this other side of you that you so consciously desperately don't want to become that person. That that can we double click on that mm -hmm. experience? What is that experience like? Um, what is it? Um, how does how does what are the strategies that that people are taught in the program to to be with those emotions and to overcome it? And not not give in, not give in, because there's a there's a huge payoff for not giving in. I mean, people who um, can resist it and go through that torture and, and come out on the other side feel report such a increased sense of meaning in their life. Yeah. There's, there's a meaning making that can happen from that resistance. Sure, but yeah. but unfortunately, that payoff is long term. Long term. And the immediate payoff of indulging the addiction is guaranteed. Yeah, oh, totally. So it's very difficult, you know, to get mm. people to wrap their heads around the long-term benefits of, of sobriety when they're just trying to get through the day. So it's yeah. all about what are you doing in this very moment and creating community and accountability around that individual and providing them with some pretty basic tools to just help them get through those intense periods of craving so that they begin to understand that those feelings are not facts mm. and that they will shift over time. And if you can weather that intense moment of craving, then it provides you with some confidence that you could do it again and you just start to stack those experiences. Yeah. But, you know, relapse is a big part of recovery. And, you know, I think relapse is often looked at as as failure, but sometimes it's just really good information about mm. what your triggers are and what kind of interior emotional experiences lead you to indulge that behavior. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, everything you're saying, I agree with so much that I'm like, I have nothing to yeah. add <laughs> to that. Yeah. No, I, I I think that's exactly right. Addiction is its own special topic, right? Within psychology, that's a whole different. Sure thing um, and addiction is is absolutely a big inhibitor of self-actualization um, for the same reason that uh, having a severe deprivation of any of your needs um, is significantly inhibiting um, who you could become. Well, it's all consuming. I mean, you can't think about anything else. That's so the there's reason. no room for you know any kind <laughs> of personal development when that is active. Yeah. Whenever there's um, any, well, we can, we can actually generalize this um, to uh, uh, Roel May had this idea of the daemonic. Um, always liked this concept. Never understood why it didn't catch on more in the in the general public. But we can have like the demonic, but that's not what he's talking about. He's saying there's a side of ourself, um, whatever is within us, that can overtake the whole person. He calls it the the, the daimonic, D A I M O N I C, mm -hmm. and um, it could. It's not necessarily bad. Um, it could entirely take over and cause self destruction and destruction of others, or it can be channeled in a way that can lead to creativity like you've never seen. So many people take their pain, their suffering, and they take their their demons um, and they use it as fuel um, for being able to think it more longer term about mm -hmm. how they're going to just use it as fuel. Use it as fuel for the work they do, the fuel they do to help others who have been addicted, um, to help others who are in a similar situation themselves. Whatever it is, they just they integrate it in such a way that it's uh, the demonic becomes uh, their creative fuel. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I question how sustainable that mm. fuel source is mm. um, because pain is akin to other base emotions that mm. tend to be unhealthy in terms of being primary motivators. Mm. But I do like this subject of, of pain being a lever for growth. And I think when, when I was on your podcast, I believe we talked about this, like, yeah change is always accessible for us. We always in every moment have the opportunity to make a better choice about something about us, right? But we generally don't do it. Pain can actually put us in that place to confront that thing we don't like about ourselves and make the better choice. And I just know, I know for myself that pain has really been the, the, the true motivator in getting me to do anything different mm -hmm. than I have, have historically. Um, so how does that, work in terms of this self-actualization process or, or cycle, because 
it is very powerful when you can channel it in a positive direction. And I'm very reluctant to intervene in, in you know, in someone's life who's, a, who's having a, a painful mm. experience because I recognize that although it looks bad and as a compassionate human being, you wanna ameliorate that in, your, in, the per, in somebody you care about, mm. but also you don't wanna rob them of mm. that experience because it might just be their greatest teacher. It really might, yeah, yeah. So um, there's different ways of like in, in getting into that question. One is, well, as a therapist or as a coach, um, and you're working with someone directly and you wanna help them grow who is experiencing that, I think that that's quite right is you want to, uh, you don't wanna tell them how to live their lives. Mm -hmm. It's very important to not uh, give people exact steps that they need to follow um, to curb something, but to help them be with things and help them um, get more in touch with their values. Again, that's, we go back to the ACT approach to therapy, which I really like, is it's a constant reorienting towards these higher values. And sometimes it's a matter of um, shift, of increasing that in your attentional field, like writing it out on a piece of paper, do whatever, make it your sh freaking screensaver of your phone. Mm -hmm. Every time you open your phone, it's like, I'm, oh, oh, that's what I'm doing in my life. Because we can so easily forget there are so many inner forces within us. Um, I mean, I this happens to me all the time. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. human too. I'll get down, I'll be on Twitter and I'll find myself down some rabbit hole fighting with some anonymous person with no name and no picture about the most minute thing. And I'm like, wait, Scott, <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Yeah. I'm th that's not what I'm on earth to do. Mm -hmm. And then I and then I recalibrate. And then it and and sometimes when I get in those moments, I will say it energizes me to go back to my mission in a way, even before i you know, it's like, oh, because I know what it feels like when I'm working on my mission, when I'm working on um, the things that are of value, I can, I can differentiate the different feelings. Mm -hmm. So also it's helping people, if like, if you're in a kind of a healing a helper role with someone who is suffering or going through this, it's also getting them in different states and helping, having them explore and have the self-awareness and understanding of how these different states feel. What kind of states do you wanna be in? What, what, who do you want to become? A lot of that is really non-judgmental and non-advice giving, but helping explore the full depths of human experience with that person and being there with them, mm -hmm. uh, supporting them in their journey of that. Yeah, I mean, just from my own non-clinical kind of modality of dealing with that, I just try to be present and loving mm -hmm. and express to them like, I'm here for you and I believe in you. Like that's, that's it. Like I'm not, I'm not gonna solve your problem. I understand that you're, in a painful moment and that that's difficult and I can empathize with that. Do you know why I'm laughing? Ultimately, you know why I'm yeah, laughing? why? Because my butt hurts right now. Oh, really? On this chair. the chair again? I feel like you're there. You're with, the only guest that's had a problem with the chair. You're with me really? on this journey. <laughs> <laughs> Am I the, I'm you the first adjust guest? It? I'm the first, because the thing is, I'm sure it's like objectively a really like profoundly comfortable chair that like yeah. everyone loves. This is why I'm weird. I'm it's so not weird. ergonomically fit to you. Do we have one of the- um, <laughs> No, no, that'd be ridiculous. We have the stool. Do we have one of those stools? And we have a couple I'm more. I'm just of laughing because I was like, like cheekily thinking as you're yeah. telling me about being one with someone with their pain. That <laughs> your I was like, thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just injecting a little right. humor into our conversation. No, it's good. Yeah, try this. That one goes up. That might be better. It, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we really changing the chair? Yeah. Okay. I want you to be comfortable. Okay. Okay. And it goes up and down. Is that better or is it worse? <laughs> Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try it. You're not sold. Let's try it. <laughs> Don't they just have normal chairs? What's wrong with these people? <laughs> I'm, I'm debating whether or not I, this was healthy authenticity on my part though. I but, appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, good. I Listen, took a risk. I, would I took rather, a risk. No, yeah. this, is, this is good. Like, let's dissect this. this. I would much rather you say like, I got a problem with this chair than like sit there like clench jawed. Yeah. You know, yeah. feeling like you can't tell me what's going on. Thank you. So this is a healthy. <laughs> Thank you. Good, 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 good. <laughs> what were we talking about? Oh, we were talking about We were being... literally talking about being with someone who's in pain. Yeah. And how do you uh, interact with them? How do you help them and guide them in their journey? And that, that's the point is you just guide, you guide people in their journey and, um, and you have, you know, they have to figure out for themselves um, what they, uh, how they can 
resiliency is something that you can only like build that muscle within yourself. Like mm-hmm. you can't like force someone to right. build those muscles. I want to shift gears a little bit. You mentioned getting into Twitter spats. Uh, can we talk, spend a few minutes talking about the yeah. psychology of the quote unquote culture war right now sure. that is transpiring on social media, at least, and spilling out into the world with real life consequences? Um, it does feel, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I find myself um, fascinated and captivated by the sort of ecosystem of secular gurus online right now um, and how that plays into the root causes of what is currently dividing us, you know, how we can heal as a nation and trying to understand it better. And I'm concerned about the incentives that are at play online and this appeal of, of heterodox thinking and thinkers that uh, appear to dominate certain issues uh, and which a lot of people find very powerless to resist. So whether it's politics or health, nutrition, vaccines, there seems to be this allure like a tractor beam mm. to this manner of issue dissection that lures for better or worse, many people into thought bubbles that become calcified. Mm. And I'm not necessarily interested in in parsing the validity of various ideas, but I'm more interested in in the kind of psychological drivers behind all of this and the binary nature of all of it, because it seems to be breeding a level of acrimony that is extremely unhealthy. And mm-hmm. even yourself, who is so studied in all of this, you know, find yourself getting into spats with people online. And I know increasingly I follow you on Twitter and I see the engagements that you have. And I know that you're um you know, very aware of kind of the dynamics that are playing out right now. I am very aware. And 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 what's what's crazy is I, I'm getting in spats with my friends, like people that my colleagues, people I've I've long known and pu- published with, they, they've gotten a really big presence and I'll disagree with something. And then now it all of a sudden becomes a war. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, right. what, what? Like, why is disagreement a war all of a sudden? <laughs> you know, um, and 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 a big part of it is in group disagreeing. Um, if you if you just if if you just disagree a little bit or, or you critique something from your in group, you're somehow appear you come across as disloyal to your in group, right. which I don't view it that way at all. It's like oh, we're just we're just having a conversation. I I mean, are you, do you think you're perfect? Like I don't think I'm perfect. Like feel free to like criticize something I do. But there's such an us versus them mentality that is driving this psychologically. Of course. You know, tribalism is nothing new, right? It's not, in the human species. It's deeply ingrained, and you can explain it evolutionarily. When you go all the way back, you know, in small bands, we had to have a very tribal mindset to survive, right? But that tribal, that same tribal mindset to survive is it's not necessary to tear so to to what's the word that's used a lot now? Um, a destroyed Ben Shapiro destroys the libs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> destroyed. Right. Everyone's trying to destroy each other, but we're not trying to learn from each other. To tie it back to Maslow, I feel like identification with certain groups online has almost superseded the importance of our connection to groups in the analog world, Mm -hmm. right? So the messaging that occurs on places like Twitter is all about placement or or kind of where where you sit with respect to your identification with a certain group, which mm. makes the whole thing very treacherous, right? And I it think does. drives that binary nature of it. Like, are you a member of this group or are you not? And before you say that, you better think about how this might reflect upon whether you're, you know, a member in good standing of of community X. That's right. It, it, there's the system is so the incentive structure, everything is so guided towards taking a side and being uh, tra- transparently in a particular identity or a particular um, ideology that people like me and there are others, <laughs> I don't think I'm the only one, but we're trying so hard to be integrative and nuanced. And there's no reward structure for that right now. No. Well, first of all, you need like <laughs> you know, a 20 tweet thread to even begin to broach any kind of nuanced (laughs) take on anything. And the incentive structures are such that it doesn't reward that. It rewards the hot take, the tweet that's gonna travel, 
the you know outrageous perspective and the clickbait title. That's right. And it's all being driven by audience capture, mm. which further you know calcifies these respective camps and drives us apart. And you know psychologically, like this is not good for us. It's not good for humanity, no. and it's causing some pretty severe real world problems. And there are good actors, but there's a lot of bad actors out there right now, smart people that yeah. I think are behaving incredibly irresponsibly. I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, the, the the big one right now that makes my head explode is the woke, anti-woke cultural war. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, you know, it, it, uh, if you, if you, I didn't know if you wanted to be a name that, or something. That like wokeism but. caused Putin to invade mm-hmm. Ukraine. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but then like, you know, there, there's this, there's this whole anti-woke crowd that, and the thing is they make some legitimate criticisms, but but legitimate criticisms, it shouldn't be like, um, well, this, I think there's a healthy, fo- again, I'm going to just be on brand here because I'm talking about healthy versus unhealthy motivations. I wish there was more healthy criticism mm-hmm. in a way that caused groups to talk to each other, right? Like, I think there's a lot of, on the so-called woke side, there's a lot of people who feel um, in their lives um they are experiencing a lot of racial discrimination, right? Like, see it from their perspective, like their own personal life, they are experiencing um, day in and day out a lot of um, discrimination that is is really uh, de- dehumanizing and inhibiting their own self-actualization. You have people on the other side, they're like, why are those people always complaining about race? I don't see race at all. I'm race blind, you know? Why can't they just shut up about race all the time? Why does everything have to be about race? Okay, look, maybe there's some valid critique on this side that like, okay, we shouldn't view everything through the lens of race, but there should also be a compassion and a, um, a, an extending of graciousness to at least acknowledge that, yes, while your whole personal life doesn't survive around race, that race is not a, doesn't play a big issue in your own life. There are people in their lives for which race does, mm-hmm. their race does play a role in, in how people treat them in their own daily lives. So I would like to see more an extending of graciousness on both sides. Does that make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, yeah. compassion, compassion, you know, empathy, <laughs> like basic. But in a way that like allows you, them to talk. Because right now there there are people that are just not talking to each other whatsoever, right? Um, and there are like some valid critiques on 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 all mm-hmm. sides. Um, it, I mean, it seems mind boggling to to think. Could we ever get people together to actually just listen to each other um, on both of these sides of the cultural war? I should be like, hmm, <laughs> like, okay, well, um, fair enough, but I'm just going to give you this little critique here. And then for the other person to be like, hmm, you're right, maybe I have been a little too race obsessed because I haven't thought about your point of view. And the other person says, huh, you know what? Actually, I can see how because I'm white, um, I actually don't have the, any of these issues that you actually legitimately probably do have. That's a fair point. But the thing is, there's not just a mature. I'm, I'm not. I'm not very sanguine that 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 can. Transpire. Well, that just be a mature way of. I know talking. it seems super basic, but the way you describe it feels like it's a South Park episode. Yeah, That's I know that would never It'd be a happen. Parody. It'd be you a know? parody, I know, right? I think behind it, you know, is this growing distrust of of institutions, and there's good reasons for that, right? Like. There's a breakdown in our trust in, in you know in 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 government and politics and you know the way that the media communicates with us and we can have arguments about the validity or or lack thereof of all of that but I think that's a real thing and I think behind the scenes that's a real driver uh, of like quote unquote heterodoxy right mm. which has become this big thing of yeah. of of having you know a contrary take on everything, and mm. packed into that is this idea that I think is misplaced, which is that the hetero- heterodox take is is always the right one, mm. and it's this purview of the free thinking rebel who's wailing against censorship, you know, versus those who side with the more conventional take that's supported by the quote unquote experts who are. You know, then maligned as as sheeple who are being duped by the previously mentioned corrupt institutions I completely uh, that agree. are hell bent on on controlling your mind. I completely agree. I like I like to think I'm just a free thinker. I'm not a free thinking rebel. The second you put in rebel, then 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 that puts too much pressure on yourself. Now that means every single thing, like you know, like you free think something, but if what if it's not rebellious? What if right. you like <laughs> the, the, the only take that travels online is the heterodox take, Correct. and with that. There's this belief that the hetero- heterodox take is is the always true correct, and in, in fact, sometimes it is. 
but most of the time it's not, it's not because there's all these people behind the scenes who are working really hard on these problems who are not going on podcasts and are not on Twitter who actually study you know subject X for a living and have a pretty good take on it and chances are they're probably more trustworthy than pontificator Y over here who's got a big following on Twitter, but is just basically a bloviating mouthpiece. Yeah, sometimes the truth is boring, right? And like, if you're a true free thinker, if you're like a true free, you sign me up and you're all in to be a free thinker, you have to say boring things sometimes. Like if you're a real truth seeker as well, you know, that's not just a free thinker, but truth seeker, mm -hmm. you know, you'll, you'll be balanced. You know, you you'll say like, okay, well, that that's true uh, on that side, and uh, uh, that oh, that's true too. You, you're looking right. for the truth. You're not looking for the the fight. <laughs> Your ego is not yeah. tied up in yeah. a pos a particular position, yeah. which p puts me in a tough position sometimes, uh, Rich Roll, because um, sometimes like I say something that doesn't uh, please anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no side gets what they want to hear from what I said. And so it's like, oh, fuck you, Scott. <laughs> it's like, well, it's like, well, no, are we all in this for the truth? Or are we all in this to, to fight? Are you in this? And, and I think that reveals biases sometimes. Yeah, well, it reveals who's a good faith actor and mm -hmm. who's, who's acting in bad faith. Yeah, that's true. But from a psychological perspective and trying to understand this, I feel like there is a characterological distinction between certain camps. Like on the one hand, you have people who are very concerned about freedom and liberty and you know the kind of more libertarian perspective. And, yeah. and, that, and that's really like a prime driver and focus for those people. And on the other hand, you have people who are thinking about collective responsibility and empathy. And I think yeah. these, are, these are individuals who, are, who have, just have very different dispositions and, and worldviews. And, mm probably you know are you know good people in their own rights or whatever uh in terms of like how they're just wired differently and so that's informing a different well, kind of siloed perspective there's a common humanity there that um that that I'd like to just call out for a second so it's usually the case like you care about uh, the vulnerable and and uh, and because the collective one you mentioned, I would say a lot of that is about care for, caring for the vulnerable mm -hmm. caring for those who are marginalized in some way um, you often find you care more about those issues when you yourself have been marginalized. I will say those who seem to be on the other side, the second that they, like, let's say they get canceled and they become marginalized, suddenly they care about marginalization. Mm -hmm. So I would say there's a, there's a real common humanity here to the extent to which um, if an issue is not affecting you personally, um, you tend to not be as concerned with that issue. When I would want to make the case for living in a civilized, I would argue a civilized society is one where you care about real issues that are happening to other people, even if it's not happening to you personally. Mm -hmm. um, because I would say that like, you know, even pe people on the right, you know, they they get they get quite angry and, and they feel like victims. They get they, they can be prone to victimization just as much as people on the left when they have when they feel like they've been victimized. And then suddenly they do care about the vulnerable, the vulnerable those who have experienced something that they have had. You know, the, the definition, the specifics of the vulnerability differ. Whereas on the left, it may be racism, it may be other things. On the right, it may be those who have been canceled and they're fighting for the, their fellow people who have been canceled. But still, fundamentally, there's a basic human thing on both sides there, which is you're fighting for someone who's been wronged or someone who's mm -hmm. been vulnerable in some way. You know, it, once you look beneath the surface there. Right. And you being this bridge between the two, Doesn't, trying to broker no a peace. <laughs> like, I just, I sort of see you doing that and I, <laughs> I don't know how well that's going. Yeah. I try and so hard, brother. Yeah. I'm trying. Um, what is the, well, well you know, how do you see it? Because you, you actually know a lot of these people. Too, I do. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm in a weird position where I feel like I am really friend, good friends with people who wouldn't talk to them, who what they themselves wouldn't talk to each other but they're friends with me. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, I, I could- You're a safe harbor for- I'm like a safe space a of, for <laughs> the right and the left uh -huh. in a lot of ways. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's um, that's point, one of my goals actually is to get people talking to uh, each other who wouldn't ordinarily talk to each other because they have a common friend in someone else. Mm -hmm. I think we need more of that. You know, we need, we need more of that, but it, it's tough. It is really tough. It, there's, a, there's constant pressures every day to take a side, constant pressures to take a side in a way that you, um, that you alienate the other side. The thing is, I'll take a side, I'll take a stand. I'm not like, I'm not a pushover, sir. 
I'm, yeah. not, a, I'm not trying to make the case no, that I'm, I know. I, I, I'm I, not a pushover, and I think there's a difference between that. Um, I will I will state my what I really believe to be true, and I will do so passionately. But often what I believe to be true has nuance, and that's not what gets rewarded today. I will be passionate in saying, like, no, I don't think that's correct, but this, the things that I'm pointing out that have the nuance are not the things that are not the kinds of stances of what I believe to be true. They get incentivized very mm -hmm. strongly mm -hmm. like amongst, you know, there are, there are people out there though that like nuance and care about that sort of, sort no, of thing. No, there are. And we were talking about this before the podcast. I feel like there's a new ecosystem that's slowly percolating mm -hmm. up that is, you know, trying to make sense of all of this stuff and, and you know, guide well-intentioned people mm -hmm. um, in a better way. But yeah. it's a difficult problem and I just see it metastasizing and it just gets hijacked by whatever the issue is of the day and everybody kind of falls in line and you know, here we are and this is what we're fighting and yelling about today. Yeah, you know, uh, I've, I've decided uh, that a much better route for me is to kind of stay in my lane to a certain degree because the more that I can uh, help people self-actualize and, and teach these principles of self actualization transcendence that are apolitical, that are a. I'm not. I'm not convinced that getting into the political muck is really uh, in line with uh, with my highest self. No, I don't and, think it is. Mm, yeah, you yeah. agree. You agree. Yeah. Um, and I think about that more and more. And you don't have to have mm, a take. That's right. You don't need a take on everything. I look at it and I'm like, <laughs> do I need to weigh in on this? <laughs> right, right. No. Right, right, right. You know. <laughs> you know. The world will continue to spin because I don't I, have to participate. That's right. And it's just pain when you do I, anyway. I feel like. I feel a bit cheekiness, but I also feel real in line with my values and delight when I get Instagram like private messages from people saying, oh, your book really touched me, it helped me in life. And then I look at their profiles like Trump supporter, right? I'm mm -hmm. like, no, that actually that actually makes me feel good that like I can get people who are so, you know, disparate, who would hate each other, but I can still reach them in a way that helps them be a better person, in a, a way that helps them be a better, uh, you know, uh, live a life of meaning. Uh, that makes me feel really good, and makes that—that's what really makes me feel most authentic and alive. Than getting stuck in this muck. Yeah, that's something that I wrestle with because, like yourself, mm -hmm. I want to cast a wide net. I'm yeah. here to be of service and help as many people as I'm capable of helping, irrespective of your political affiliation. Mm -hmm. God forbid. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and how does that measure up to? Um, you know, the idea that if you have a platform, you have a responsibility to kind of speak your truth, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and that truth might be divisive and alienate certain people who would otherwise be happy to listen to you or, you know, talk about things that are quote unquote more in your lane. Well, this is another big source of the issue is that we uh, now treat experts um, as experts in everything. Um, you know, like the you're getting like brain. Rogue, you're getting Jordan Pearson on Rogue. By the way, mm -hmm. you know Jordan's a, a friend, colleague, but so not no no shade. But you get him on jo on Rogan, and Rogan's asking him about like climate change. Well, they're talking about climate change. That's it's my the point. galaxy brain. Yeah, like, correct. Oh, I'm, I've been celebrated in this yes. one field, so correct. suddenly I'm a genius about every. Why subject. would that mean you know everything? And um, it didn't. I don't feel like things used to be that way. I think something has changed. Like I remember the days when I would be on podcasts, and they'd ask me about what I damn know about. <laughs> now. People, uh, you know, it's like everything. You, you, suddenly, if you're an expert in something, then they're like, oh, well, what are your thoughts on race relations? And it's like, do I need to have, be an expert on race relations? I didn't study that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there is some relationship between that and our uh, dissolving confidence in institutions, right? Like mm -hmm. the idea that, well, the people, you know, who are quote unquote qualified to speak to that have been proven unreliable or liars or whatever. So now we have to look to these people that we we deem to be intelligent and we grace them with much more leeway and bandwidth than they're deserving of. And that cycle it creates in their minds the idea that then therefore they are experts sure. in all those things. Yeah, it builds upon That's itself. That's the cycle and then I'm seeing. The, the power, narcissism and all of that starts to accelerate. And that's really, I think, what you're seeing in this secular guru space Because right now. a lot of these secular gurus, as you put it, um, will start to think, oh, well, maybe I am an expert on COVID vaccines. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, you're still not an expert on COVID vaccines just because your followers tell you you are. Like there's something it means to be an expert on right. that and you're not it. <laughs> right, right. The, the psychology professor who is now an expert on 
nutrition. Right. Yeah. Right. I right. mean, I, I mean, it's crazy, man. I mean, I don't, like, I'm not at my best when I go f- so out of my lane. I'm really not at my best because, and there's a reason for that. It's because I've put my heart and soul and studied something that I know pretty well. And, and, and the other things I don't know as well. Like it's not rocket science why I'm not at my best when I go outside my lane. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you understand human behavior and human motivation. That castle wide net. Yeah. <laughs> that- which, which makes it understandable why you are on Twitter so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to understand yeah. what is going on. Good luck with that. <laughs> what is this happening? This massive human experiment that's being conducted right now. What is going on? Where all these brains are colliding with each other in ways productive and not so much. I mean, I can say the most innocuous, seemingly innocuous statement um, to try to bring love and joy and peace. And all people respond, stop virtue signaling simp. Mm-hmm. I mean, it happened the other day. And I was like, what is like I want to understand this. I'm not actually hurt by that. I, I'm more curious. Like I want to understand the psychology of someone who reads a tweet of something that's like, let's just have more like let's peace, love, you know, to be like stop virtue signaling simp. Like what causes what is it within you that causes you mm-hmm. to like interpret through that lens? It's just it's fat, isn't it fascinating? Well, you're the psychologist. Yeah, well, it's a deprivation motivation for sure, but it's you know. It's one that's becoming increasingly common on social media where we're now being so cynical that that anyone's attempt to improve the world is some cynical political power move. And that's what worries me because I see a lot of genuine attempts. I mean, I, I, I still see the good in people. I'm sorry. Like, I don't know why I have to fight. I have to fight to tell people they're still good in humans. Mm-hmm. And that seems like a fight that, should, that I should never have to have. <laughs> it's very strange. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. Well, we can't end this podcast on that <laughs> note, right? Like, let's let's. Well, get I did back say there's good in humans. So that's what's a good that? thing. I yeah, did say there, this. there. Listen, humans. The humans. I believe in the goodness of humans too, but yeah. there is something about this this you know specific dynamic that brings the worst it's out. Cynicism. Out this. Yeah. Cynicism that that none of us have that goodness. Mm. All right. Well, let's 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 switch back to a little bit of uh, transcendence and self-actualization. Better to end on transcendence. Here, right? <laughs> um, you know, I always try to end these things by putting myself in the, in the, in the seat of, of the listener or the viewer or the person who is, um, who is perhaps struggling with, with meeting some of the baser, uh, you know, needs along the hierarchy. Like I'm just like, just trying to be a little bit better. I'm living an average life. I work mm-hmm. a normal job. I don't have that much free time or that much expendable income. Mm. How can I begin the process of just trying to, you know, you know, ascend this hierarchy a little bit and build a little bit more meaning and purpose into my life? I mean, you referenced, you know, earlier in the podcast some simple things that that can be done to kind of initiate this process, but let's let's mm. kind of continue on that thought. Yeah, I mean, I I have in the book a, a bunch of uh, exercises to help get you more in the B realm of human existence. Um, I think that a big part of it is becoming aware of when you are becoming deficiency motivated and really becoming self-aware of that and seeing how it really feels in your body um, and realigning yourself with um, constantly, constantly choosing the growth option, constantly aligning yourself um, with your values, but also seeking out beauty more in your life, seeking out people that are beautiful. And I'm not just talking physical beauty. You know, there are people who are beautiful. Surround mm-hmm. yourself with those people. There, there's so much muck and ugliness on Twitter. There's so much they can they can start to make you think as though that's all there is to the world. So I think a lot of it is really um, your attention. Uh, where do you put your attention? Where you put your attention is where you put your life. Um, and I think that uh, so much derives from that, uh, that knowledge of that fact. Um, you know, uh, the, some of the greatest lessons I learned from from these mindfulness gurus, like people, I, friends I have who are like are expert meditators, is that you can have the pain. You know, you can have this thing that annoys you. You know, and if you're focused on it or annoy you, it just annoy you so much. But if your attention is just focused on um, the good and the beauty in the world, you know, you, you start to just like forget these other things exist to a certain extent. Now, it's also true that. If you have pain, the more you focus just on the pain, the more it subsides as well. So this stuff is nuanced. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I will say that, um, you know, I just want us to not forget that there is um, there, there is a higher nature to humans. And this is this is uh, where, where Maslow really wanted to go with all. I read his unpublished 
essays. Right, his work was not done, right? Mm. And a big part of the book is you extrapolating on where he was heading and trying to you know, reinterpret and reimagine where that might land. Yeah, and a big part of it was that there is an innate, intrinsic, higher nature to humans um, that is just as real as our lower nature, um, but it takes more work to uh, to transcend all of the uh, forces internal and external that are uh, are really keeping us away from being able to see it. But there are things we can do. There really are. And I think they it, it really is about simple choices that you start to make. And there's a momentum that takes place over time when you begin to yeah. practice those things with some regularity. I'll tell you one thing, uh, when uh, a surprising intervention in clinical psychology um, for someone who uh, is feeling depressed, someone who um, is feeling, um, uh, they're saying, I always have these obsessive ruminations over and over again, H- help me. Um, here's the hack for that. Stop thinking about yourself so much. <laughs> <laughs> one well, of the come on. easier what, said than what, done. Well, but one of the interventions that has been scientifically studied is something called uh, moral elevation. So this is a concept that uh, my colleague Jonathan Haidt uh, studied, moral elevation. So research shows that um, a better way to help people with these kinds of issues than to keep obsessively talking about um, these issues and to talk about um, uh, their feelings and how they always feel negative emotions is to get them in touch with um, role models, with um, examples of of moral humans that are doing incredibly inspiring things um, that can elevate your whole emotional system. Yeah. So, so there really is something to helping people get more into transcendent states of being, um, getting you outside of yourselves, and to not be so neurotic, uh, because neurotic is a form of narcissism. You know, yeah. you're so self-focused. And uh, some of the best ways of overcoming this is just shifting your 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 attention outside mm-hmm. of yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in uh, in in twelve step, the the sort of simple tool for getting out of your self obsession is to immediately go help somebody else who needs help. There you, you go. Know, like pick up the phone and just call somebody. They who, had it all right, didn't they? Having, oh, yeah, <laughs> we don't even need psychology. It's divinely <laughs> inspired. It's yeah. you know an incredibly profound. Um, text and, and rule book for living that, that feels so ahead of its time in certain ways. Yeah, you know? so true. When I'm around someone who's a morally elevating individual, I just like forget about a lot of my problems. You know, I just like, I'm just like, how do I want, how do I be more of that guy <laughs> or girl mm-hmm. or woman, <laughs> whatever your gender is, how can I be more of that? Yeah, but another person who's perhaps struggling a little bit more might look at that person and just be resentful and angry. And that happens to me sometimes. I mean, I like I said, I get these comments. You never would expect such a comment, right? Like you write something positive, inspirational, mm-hmm. and you go like, "Fuck off, you right. idiot!" It, well, because being <laughs> earnest is somehow a threat. Yeah, I haven't really fully figured that one out. Like, what is it in? What is it that is a threat? Like, what is it the threat to people when you're being positive or when you're, you're trying? You're to- a weak beta. It's a it's a sort of a beta thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so strength is this sort of uh, uh, notion of masculinity as not showing empathy or not showing emotion. How can we make compassion cool? Like I almost want to say again, but I don't think it's ever been really cool. Um, but how can we make compassion just as cool as like standing up and owning someone? I'm trying to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think yeah. the way that you do it is you model it in an aspirational mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. And you find a way to channel it through a certain type of masculinity that's attractive to that wayward young man who's mm. looking for a mentor or some kind of guidance. Yeah. Um, but you do it without the toxic aspects of what it means to be masculine, right? So that's why I think athletes hold a special place in the public discourse because mm. for a certain type of young man like that, type of physical prowess means something. Mm. It's demonstrative in an active way. And I think it's incumbent upon athletes to understand that and take responsibility Mm. for that in a way that can be positively impactful for younger people who are looking up to them. It's Mm. an opportunity to model masculinity in 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 a way that provides space for compassion and empathy and you know, I do it through through you know 
veganism is a good mm-hmm. way of doing it. Like if I can be fit and physically active, but also be like a voice for the animals, yeah. which is, you know, considered to be kind of a beta thing, right? But recast Why it in an aspirate. I mean, do we have three hours to talk about that? Like, I mean, I wrote an article. The role of masculinity right. in food choice is like a whole strange psychological sticky wicket. So like paleo is like manly. Yeah. Yeah, because you're eating. It, it appeals to a certain type of person who's looking for an identity. Like the 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 role of identity in, in the nutrition world mm. is like a super interesting thing. Mm. So. Yeah, I, and I know that that is a topic for another day, but I, mm-hmm. I wrote an article called Myth of the Alpha Male because I think that young men who are trying to figure out how to to have more women in their, you know, women in their life, they need to look more along the lines of what the science says about what women actually want, not what men think women want. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Imagine that. Mm. Because men Let's have it wrong. Start there. Men yeah. actually have it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> a real man to a woman, it tends to be a little bit different than what a real man is if, when it turns to male to male competition. Right. Like what what a, a real what a man would think a real man would be to a woman versus what a woman is actually looking for. And what a woman really considers a real man. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like those um normative definitions are are in flux right now. Mm. You know, and in in, well, in, in a positive way. Mm. In a largely positive way. I don't know. Way. What do I know? <laughs> not much, Scott. <laughs> not as much as you. That's definitely not true. Uh, <laughs> it depends on the stuff. topic. It depends on the topic. Um, cool, man. Well, I think we did it. How do you feel? Uh, I feel my, my butt feels good. You feel good? Better. Do you like that chair no, better? I like this chair much better. Yeah. 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 No, did I we, feel very good. Do we cover all the stuff? We covered a lot of good ground, but like, let's keep up the conversation. Yeah, you know, like I'd we're like in some to have more you spaces. Back. Yeah, yeah, we can pull on. We can pull on some more threads. We're in some more spaces, yeah. and I really like your way of being, a yeah. lot. Thank you, a lot. I appreciate that. Likewise, um, if people want to uh, learn more about you, of course, please pick pick up uh, Scott's latest book, Transcend: The New Science of Self Actualization, which you can find on his website, which I'll link up in the show notes or on Amazon or wherever you buy books. Also, tell me a little bit about this new, I mean, you moved from the East Coast, you're no longer, you know, captured by the Ivy League institutions. No. You're free, free on the on the left coast to, say whatever here, I to want fly on your freak flag. And you've got this, like you opened up this institute, right? Yeah, I, I started the Center for the Science of Human Potential. And we do courses like we did. We're doing an eight-week transcend course to help people. Um, we're working on all sorts of collaborations and working on a collaboration with Second City Improv to do like improv oh, for cool. self actualization. Um, I'm working on a self actualization coaching certification program um, that can be used in different sectors of, of society, including education. I'd love for teachers to start to rethink mm-hmm. their role in the classroom or yeah. self actualization coaches. Um, yeah, I really feel like I'm living my. Uh, values, uh, the the things I want to do to help people um, realize their potential. And, you know, I, I get to like, you know, do a lot of edibles on the beach. So that's good. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Good for you. Am I allowed to say hey, that? Hey, listen, I, could, I would if I could, you know, yeah. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, let's do this again sometime soon. Uh, you can learn more about Scott at his what your website, Scott Barry Kaufman. Here I have the hype. Yeah, it's scottbarrykaufman.com. Yeah, Scott um, but Barry. I have a, a book coming out this year uh, called Choose Growth that it'll just I think it'll help a lot of people. Um, it'll be it's the workbook companion to Transcend. Transcend was published during the start of a global pandemic. Yeah. Would not wish that on anyone publishing a book. Um, this one with a little more forethought planning. We actually have a book that can help people grow from the pandemic itself. So what I did is I, I used the situation and I made lemon out of lemonades, right? I published yeah. a book that like, of course, no one read because it came out the day yeah. the pandemic started. <laughs> so um, brutal. And I used it as a way of like, you know what? I'm going to work the uh, next couple of years on a book that um, uh, I'm going to get ahead of this. I'm going to get ahead of this and really help people um, specifically um, who had some sort of uh, setback during the pandemic, you know, as I did with this, mm. you know, with lots of things. Um, we And we all had uh, so... I think we can really grow. So yeah, it's called Choose yeah. Growth. Cool, man. When's that coming out? That's coming out uh, September of this year. I co-wrote it with Jordan Feingold, who is the founder of a field called Positive Medicine. Um, and she was also a former undergraduate student of mine at Penn. I, she came into my office as an undergrad 
um, telling me that she wants to go to med school and loves positive psychology. And I was like, you should start a field of positive medicine. And she's like, really? I was like, yeah, here we are almost 10 years later. She has her MD and she is le the leader of the field of positive medicine. Couldn't be wow. more proud of her. So we teamed up on this book um, to really figure out how we can help people, not just body, not just mind, but body as well. You yeah, know? cool, man. Well, yeah. when that comes out, come back and we can talk about that. Thank you. All right, man. Peace. 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 <laughs> oh. <laughs>